Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. We should proceed. Okay, welcome to Vilnius Security Forum 2023. Uh, this is already eighth event uh, of such kind. We began uh, conferences organizing together with our partner, Lithuanian Parliament, uh, since 2015. And of course, uh, unfortunately, in 2020, COVID pandemic uh, forced us to cancel our one conference, so it would be nine. But nevertheless, we keep going. And uh, today we will have uh, a topic of the conference, Deterrence by Unified Defense. And this conference will be also uh, trans uh, transmitted online. So we will have audience uh, who will be able to ask questions and, and participate via SLIDO program. So please follow the links on the program below the list. And now I would like to invite uh, for the welcome remarks uh, Speaker of the Parliament, uh, Ms. Victoria Chmilitia Nilsson. Uh, Ma'am, the floor is yours. Good morning, dear participants of the Vilnius Security Forum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this event for their initiative and for bringing us all together to discuss what is in all probability the major topic of today, uh, security. Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and its consequences for Ukraine, for Europe, and for international system as a whole are so far-reaching that the subject of security has been demanding our constant attention for many months now and is unlikely to go away anytime soon. In fact, security issues started to concern us, Lithuanians, way before February 24th last year. With hindsight, it appears that the migratory pressure on our eastern borders in the summer of 2021 were part of the Kremlin's larger plan to destabilize the situation in our region, create political turmoil, drive a wedge between the EU countries, distract from the Kremlin's preparation to attack Ukraine, put pressure on our financial and logistical resources, and so on and so forth. However, Lithuania's painful historic experience and a good knowledge of our eastern neighbor helped us remain vigilant. Then again, we have been signaling to our allies in the West what we are dealing with for at least a decade. It might be tempting to say we told you so, but I would rather put it in chess terms. We see the moves on the board for what they are and not what we would like them to be. And today the situation is rather black and white. On the anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Karl Bildt asked in his article the question, where would we be now if Russia had achieved its strategic objectives, if Ukraine had been defeated and the West had not demonstrated unity? One of the conclusions he draws is that today Europe would be on the brink of a much bigger war. As a Lithuanian, I fully share that insight. We have not yet fully grasped for ourselves what a gift to Ukraine has given us, has given to the whole of the West by providing us time to realize where we stand and who we are dealing with. I would like to believe that one thing which has really happened is that the West has woken up from its geopolitical lethargy. So far, the United Western reaction to the Russian invasion gives hope. 
Whether we will manage not to fall back into our old tracks will depend on what we do next. The simple fact is that Russia is ready for a long-term strategic confrontation with the West. But are we ready? Today's conference will focus on defensive deterrence and the best ways and means to achieve it. However, as a politician, I believe that a holistic approach to deterrence and security is necessary with a close interplay between military, socio-political, economic and energy aspects. Some of those are best dealt at a national level, others at EU, NATO level, but in any case, everything must be closely coordinated at transatlantic level. As for the latter aspect, it is another silver lining to an otherwise very difficult times. To see that after several years of concern in Europe and the United States about our slow, long-term drifting apart, both sides have succeeded in rediscovering the meaning and the importance of the transatlantic relationship. We must keep this reinvigorating impact of the war as strong as possible. What is true of transatlantic unity is also true of European unity. The European unity demonstrated in the face of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been a definite success for us and a definite disappointment for Putin. Perhaps we in Lithuania would have liked to have seen that unity on the basis of the highest common denominator, which could be measured in terms of the severity and scope of the sanctions, but we cannot underestimate the unity demonstrated. However, as in the case of transatlantic relations, the centrifugal forces have not gone away and they will tend to grow stronger as the impact of the first shock of war wears out. We very much hope that we in Europe will pass this test. Now a couple of remarks on the military aspect. During the last year's Madrid summit, NATO leaders agreed on a shift in NATO's deterrence and defense. We have strengthened forward defenses and enhanced battle groups in the eastern part of the alliance. NATO allies also agreed to invest more in NATO and to increase common funding. As the level of threats continues to grow, there is urgency to turn these declarations into practical steps. That is why next summit, which will be held in three and a half months' time in Vilnius, is going to be so important. Lithuania specifically is looking for approval of new NATO defense plans, including regional ones, setting up of air and missile defense rotational model, and scaling up EFP to brigade. This is the minimum NATO must do to prevent a very real and a growing danger. I stress this not only in the view of Russia's war in Ukraine and the nature of the war it is waging there, but also following the announcement of the latest plans for the modernization and the growth of Russia's armed forces towards the West. Success of Vilnius summit will also depend on the decisions we take on Ukraine. We need to be ambitious and agree on practical and political measures that would bring Ukraine as close as possible to the alliance. Of course, we would also like to welcome our newest NATO allies, members of our family, Sweden and Finland. Their still pending NATO membership is the next big development in the wake of Russia's war in Ukraine. A positive development, no doubt. In addition to all the positive contributions that Sweden and Finland will make to NATO's collective defense, their accession to NATO will radically change the geostrategic situation in the Northern Europe and above all in the Baltic Sea region, giving us much needed strategic depth and providing a real counterweight to Russia's air access, air denial capabilities in the Baltic Sea area. In shaping the NATO agenda, I believe that the parliaments should also play a very important role. To the center, I have taken the initiative to invite the speakers of the parliaments of the NATO countries to Vilnius one month before the Vilnius summit. I take this opportunity to address the representatives of the NATO countries here to urge speakers of their parliaments to uh, accept this invitation and to come here to discuss the political agenda and the preparation to the NATO summit. One more final insight for our further discussion. Since Russia's deterrence involves not only military but also economic elements, it is important not to jump from bear to dragon in doing so. 
For instance, our transition from dependency on Russia and from f fossil fuel to green energy must be built on secure foundations without further geopolitical risks. And the threat is real. The negative consequences of Russia's invasion is the strengthening of the Russian-Chinese bloc and other authoritarian states. China-Russia alliance no longer hides its ambition to change the existing world order. And in the long run, China, not Russia, will play the leading role. China's efforts to build a community of countries opposed to the West under the Global Security Initiative is of great concern. Therefore, transatlantic cooperation and political dialogue with like-minded countries will be essential in building resilience to uphold the rule-based order. We will only preserve what has been created by the community of democratic countries if we treat an attack on one democracy as an attack on a whole democratic world. Thank you for your attention, and I wish you a good conference. Thank you. Okay, now we will have a welcome speech of Mr. Laurinas Kashunas, uh, Chairman of the Committee of National Security and Defense. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, he had to leave the country and uh, we will uh, place his uh, prepared uh, uh, welcome. So please. Dear colleagues, dear participants of the conference, First of all, I'm very glad to say what uh, our uh, Parliamentary Committee of National Security and Defense could be a co-organizer, traditional co-organizer of this great conference. But I also I want to say that I'm very sorry, but I'm not, uh, I'm not here with you because I'm on the visit to the United States, to the geopolitical power center of our Western civilization. And of course, it's uh, important to be here in Washington, D.C. Uh, because of upcoming NATO summit and uh, U.S. Uh, role in our security. Uh, the Conference on Collective Defense and Security is, of course, a broad thing and broad topic. But uh, from my point of view, I will say a uh, few important things. Uh, first of all, I've, we should do not, uh, um, we don't have a possibility to make a mistake and to think that Russian capabilities, even during the war in Ukraine, uh, decreased. Uh, yes, in technological terms, uh, we have big problems and big challenges, but at the same, the same uh, time, the all indicators shows that we can reestablish its capabilities even during the war. Uh, and the plan which was announced by Shoigu to re restore the capabilities, even to double its capabilities on a Western direction, like a reaction to the Swedish and Finnish accession to NATO, uh, it should be uh, seen as a real plan of Russia. We can do it and we should adopt it. And uh, this is a challenge for us. Uh, Russia can have war even not having economical welfare. We cannot uh, see Russia uh, and evaluate Russia just using uh, Western criteria. Uh, this country, this society uh, is an existential threat for us and we should adapt to it, to have our deterrence and defense plans. So it's a crucial period of time. We need to uh, not only to think but to act, to make a strong decisions. When we say here in Lithuania the forward defense or brigade size in place, I am joking sometimes it's uh, like uh, word number four or number five now in, in the families and the youngsters of Lithuanian families, uh, with, um, mother, father and there is a brigade because it's vital for us. It's so big national interest to have as much as possible um, allies, troops, NATO troops here in Lithuania. That's why we are fighting for uh, as much as possible troops here in place in our country. Uh, forward defense idea, uh, it's a vital force. So we would, would like to achieve real credible results in the Vilnius Summit. Not only step-by-step -step approach, but to have real NATO understanding what we need to do in eastern flank to deter 
and if it's needed to defend all uh, region and the Baltic states included. So forward defense and uh, brigade size on, on the ground, it's one top priority. At the same time, NATO summit uh, will bring us new regional plans, defense plans, new regional force posture. It means uh, what, how much real forces, real dedicated brigades and divisions will come to defend Baltic states if it's needed from one day to 10, from 10 to 30, and, uh, and so, and etc. So we need to have real, not only virtual, not only paper-based, but real uh, capabilities to reinforce Baltic defense when it's needed. So we need to have as much as possible in-place forces and as much as possible dedicated uh, forces which will come to support us. So this is about the real change in eastern flank and we hope it, we can succeed. We will find resources and political will in the western uh, world to make these strong decisions. Another very important angle is of course air defense. As you know, uh, we are quite sensitive in this area. That's where we are seeking transformation of the air policing mission into the air defense mission or to deployment of the middle or, or long range air defense systems to the Baltics on a rotational basis is also a big, uh, big national interest, vital interest of our country and of all free Baltic states. At the same time, we are preparing ourselves. We started to engage our society into the total defense system. We are making stronger our riflemen union, union as a paramilitary organization. We will decide in the near future to develop our army uh, to the division level, uh, to make it stronger, uh, to make it capable to fight in depth our enemy. And we hope all these tools will help us to deter Russians, to deter our enemies, which as I said is existential. As you know, we have Kaliningrad region, enclave, militarized enclave. We have Belarus, which is totally dependent on Russia, we, and we do not consider it as an independent state. So we feel ourselves a little bit captured, geopolitically captured. That's why we need strong forward defense idea, strong national capabilities, total defense concept when society is engaged into the defense. So I wish you a fruitful discussion, uh, good ideas, but what is the most important, good decisions. Thank you. Okay, now I would like to invite our keynote speaker, uh, Mr. Jonas Survila who is a Vice Minister of Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, sir, floor is yours. Dear Vaidotas, first of all, I try, I'll, I'll, I'll need to confess. I feel very uncomfortable to be here for two reasons. One, when uh, during conference dinner yesterday, Vaidotas unexpectedly asked me to deliver a toast, I told all the best jokes and, and key messages yesterday, so I ran out of ammo. This is quite often a problem, a big problem in Europe, but, but we'll manage, hope. With it, uh, last Jumbo meeting, by the way, in Brussels, made a good decision in this regard, in, in, in making a better and faster production of ammo. Second, more serious, uh, reason is that in contrary to our eastern neighbors and uh, that are in the east, in the closed vicinity in the east, we tend to listen for military advice and our policy expert advice and not vice versa. So I think uh, keynote speakers and the main ideas will be in the panel discussions. So uh, we'll be looking forward to, to hearing you there. But I have a duty uh, and privilege still to address and to share uh, the ideas, assessment, reflections, and concerns 
which we have here in the Baltics, Lithuania, Vilnius, how we see political strategy of deterrence and defense of freedom. Because defense of freedom, I think, is the best title to describe what Ukrainians are actually doing since February 24th. And I see Yulia, Vera, Oleksii here in the hall, and we are very grateful for your and your countrymen's courage and sacrifice. Today, Ukraine is the greatest provider and contributor to European security. <laughs> Brave and courageous Ukrainian men and women are fighting and sacrificing themselves daily in defending their freedom, but not only. They're defending Europe's freedom, and I think it wouldn't be overstatement to say defending world's freedom, as I'm sure other dictators and authoritarians from nearby Belarus, just 40 kilometers from here, half an hour drive when we don't have a traffic jam, from this, this building, in Iran, or a bit further in Beijing, are also closely watching Ukrainian fight and making their own calculations and adjustments to their own plans and their foreign policy and military strategies. Defending the very principles that European continent security was built upon after Second World War and giving us a possibility to gather here in Vilnius freely and safely to have an intellectual debate and exchange of ideas and not to look for, for shelter from missiles or drone attacks. So, Dakuyu Ukraini. We gather here to discuss very important topics and during historic times. We are entering the last stages of the preparations for the NATO summit in Vilnius at the time when Putin, together with his accomplices, continued to wage his barbaric war of aggression in Europe while hiding from justice and the ICC warrant behind the walls of Kremlin. Putin's Russia has been challenging the rules-based international order for at least a few decades now. And during those decades, Russia went from attacking Georgia in 2008 to occupying Crimea and parts of Donbass in 2014 to a full-scale war against Ukraine a year ago. The very fact that this happened suggests that something has been missing in our wider deterrence strategy so far. The way we see effective deterrence is probably not enough to deter Russia. The Baltic and Poland countries have sounded the alarm before, but as former Estonian President uh, Thomas Henrik Ilves well put it, we have, we have kept pressing the snooze button to postpone awakening. I think if we continue doing this further, next time we won't be able to awaken. We will be dead. We will be killed while we are asleep and or hibernating. But I'm sure it won't happen. Our alliance is not brain dead. We have a lot of brains and expertise in this room. So looking forward for your ideas. Because to effectively deter Russia, to discourage it from taking military action against Ukraine and NATO, first of all, we need to be frank in our assessment of the adversary and then act accordingly. So while some in the West wanted to believe that mutual economic interdependence, trade and energy relations might substitute geopolitics and national security principles, Putin proved that he believes only in so-called kontaktnaya geopolitik, going as far as possible and projecting its power by all means available until it is stopped by another power, ignoring all possible borders geographical and legal ones, and I would add even human ones, as we see unconceivable examples of genocide-like acts of brutality, torturing and killing Ukrainian civilians, jailing them in filtration camps, kidnapping kids in the 21st century. Today we witness the true face of Russian imperialism based on disrespect for human rights, international agreements, and the territorial integrity of states, Russian imperialism is revanchist in nature and is bound to repeat own methods of terror. 
We too experienced this in 1940 and later years. What happened in Georgia and Crimea is being repeated on a large scale today in the rest of Ukraine. Though Putin is attacking across all possible domains, militarily on the battlefield, in economy and energy, in informational sphere and cyber, in neither one is he superior or invincible. As soon as Ukrainians were provided with better modern Western artillery systems and ammunition, the tide of war began to shift. Putin's Russia is not the Soviet Union and isn't world's second superpower. Combined Nordic Baltic countries' GDP is higher than Russia's. However, even a recently weakening Russia is dangerous one and has to be contained. At the end of last year, in December and later this January, Russia, as Laurinas Kashunas, our chairman of National Security and Defense Committee, mentioned, Russia officially decided, announced, and confirmed that in the next three years, they will increase their army by up to 40%, till 1.5 million servicemen will reestablish two multi-service strategic territorial formations, the Moscow and Leningrad military districts, will turn seven brigades into motorized infantry divisions, including in our vicinity, and even more. Though, of course, uh, real uh, capabilities and, and the time of an implementation might differ and take longer, and it depends on the, how the war in Ukraine goes on, but the direction, the intent, the direction is very clear. They are ready for a long confrontation with NATO and will spare no resources. Russia has also increased cooperation with other autocratic states, China, Iran, North Korea, to challenge our democratic values, political systems, and way of life. This brief but by no means complete assessment of developments in Russia is already enough to make a conclusion that Russia is set to remain a long-term military threat to NATO and to our partners. This leads me to a question. If we have failed to deter Russia on too many occasions, what we must do further to stop, to stop the aggression cycle and to make sure that we deny even the possibility of thinking about the aggression? How do we make Russia afraid to attack? Sometimes difficult questions require simple answers. The formula is rather simple. Ukrainian victory on the battlefield, its eventual integration to both EU and NATO, and in the meantime, credible reinforcement of NATO's forward defense and deterrence posture in the eastern flank. Putin has to lose in Ukraine. Strong, independent, and democratic Ukraine is vital for stability of your Atlantic area. And holding the aggressor accountable is a matter of our own strength and credibility. The success of Ukraine is a nightmare for Putin because a democratic and, and prosperous Ukraine is also a cat catalyst, a necessary precondition for Russia's democratic transformation and peaceful future. Ukraine is not a part of the Russian world. Ukraine has chosen democracy. It has chosen us, and it is our duty to support Ukraine with arms and politically. What is worrying is that we still lack political determination to achieve Ukraine's victory. We are often confront confronted with unfounded fears of a possible Russian defeat. These fears were also present when the Soviet Union collapsed, but they didn't materialize. We should not be afraid of Ukraine winning, Ukrainians have the agency to decide on conditions of peace. Pushing Ukraine to accept ceasefire or any form of frozen conflict would only encourage Russia to continue its aggressive policies in the region and beyond. Agreements similar to Minsk I and II would only be a prelude to a new war. Therefore, it is important to continue sending all possible military support to Ukraine. Although we have made good steps recently and decisions, we still have a few mental self-imposed red lines to cross. We should not impose self-containment on ourselves. It is clear that Russia escalates whenever it's, it deems necessary and irrespective of our support to Ukraine. 
Russia's war in Ukraine has united different, spot, different parts of Europe and your Atlantic community in determination to back Kiev's independence. According to the latest European Council on Foreign Relations study, more people in Europe back the notion that Ukraine needs to regain all its territory, even if it means a longer war, instead of ending the war as soon as possible. For decision makers, it's another argument, an additional mandate to act. Therefore, we need to send now everything Ukraine needs to finish this war sooner, including long-range weapons. We are good in donating and sending power generators to Ukraine, but we still need to catch up in generating political will. The Leopard Coalition shows that countries can step up, and we hope that the Aircraft Coalition will also move forward, and that Ukraine will not only get MiGs, but also airplanes, which title starts from letter F. In order for, the Ukraine to, for Ukraine to be secure and for us to ensure stability in Europe and the Atlantic area, we need to have a clear prospect of NATO membership for Ukraine. No bilateral security guarantees will be able to replace the security provided by Ukraine's NATO membership. Only in a secure Ukraine will democracy and market economy be able to flourish. In the meantime, we need to invest in our own defense capabilities to be able to implement the concept of forward defense in practice. That is why we want full implementation of NATO's Madrid commitments as situation in the region, in our region, didn't get better, to say it politely. Belarus is currently being swallowed by Russia and Lukashenko is acting as Putin's partner in crime and crime of aggression and further filling Belarus with Russian Army's command and control centers, thousands of troops, tanks, missiles, fighter jets, altering already unfavorable military balance in our region even more, especially when we add Russian military plans that I described earlier into equation. NATO Madrid summit did well to reflect the new security reality, and decisions were made to enhance deterrence and defense posture in Alliance Eastern Flank in the air, land, and sea. NATO moved from deterrence by punishment based on limited forward presence to deterrence by denial based on modern forward defense. But if we look at the progress since Madrid, I'm still worried, especially when the talk comes to an increase of troops on the ground. Eastern flank is the front line of the alliance, and Lithuania serves as a vital connection point between Nordic, Baltic, and central parts of Europe, being sandwiched between Kaliningrad and Belarus, de facto Russia, and attached to the rest of NATO only through 100 kilometers wide Suwalki corridor. Suwalki gap, in our case, is like Fulda gap during the Cold War, but without four combat divisions from the United States. Vilnius, which I mentioned is half an hour drive from Belarus border and geographically the closest NATO capital to Moscow, is like West Berlin, but still without Berlin Brigade. We need and ask NATO defense plans, including regional, with assigned forces, air and missile defense, and combat-ready allied brigade in place in Lithuania which would play a major role in securing the strategically vital Suwalki corridor and thus would contribute to the security of all three Baltic states. Real and credible deterrence by denial and forward defense concept cannot be substituted by deterrence by statements. We, great, we greatly value and sincerely Germany's contribution to our security. Germany is one of our key allies in security and defense cooperation. We salute and welcome German Zeitenwende and we are determined to create together its success story in the Baltics. Lithuania has a clear political will and national consensus to accommodate more German troops and other allies troops on the ground. We will ensure that by 2026, 
Lithuania is ready to accept full combat-ready rotational German brigade for heel-to-toe presence in Lithuania. This term is realistic and corresponds to the spirit of the joint communique. So we are ready to invest heavily in host nation support to prepare the necessary infrastructure for German brigade. It is our common interest to increase defense spending and speed up our defense modernization. We see that years of insufficient investment in European defense capabilities now reflect in our limited ability to support Ukraine and to strengthen NATO's eastern flank. NATO defense spending between 1960 and 1992 during the Cold War constituted 4.96% of GDP on average. While after the end of Cold War, defense expenditures fell twice to 2.64% of GDP, but still high, high percentage is, is because few partners contribute greatly to this, to this occasion and not all. While after, at NATO summit in Vilnius, next to ambitious decisions on Ukraine and NATO's deterrence and defense, so we also expect the renewal of defense investment pledge beyond 2024. I didn't mention Finland and Sweden. Why? Not only because our uh, speaker of the parliament greatly elaborated it, but also because mentally it's already in the alliance. And I hope we will overcome, overcome last obstacle, obstacles as soon as possible to join it fully and legally and finish the procedure. It's about the procedure not about real belonging. So to wrap it up, let's trust Ukraine more and provide further with more and better weapons. It will save lives of Ukrainians and it will bring victory sooner. Let's not be afraid of nuclear blackmail and Putin's chicken game. Help Putin accountable for its crimes. Ukrainians are not afraid, so why we should be afraid? And we should not be afraid of Ukrainian victory, too. In order to contain Putin's Russia, we should first stop self-containment. Do not self-contain. Be brave like Ukraine. Be innovative and creative like Ukraine. Slava Ukraini! <clears throat> Have a good and fruitful conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, and now I would like to invite first panel for the panel discussion. Uh, please uh, take your seats in front of the audience. And I would like to introduce uh, the moderator of the panel, uh, Mrs. Beta Patashova. Uh, she is a program officer. She's a program officer at NATO headquarters. She's in charge of NATO public diplomacy engagements with Russia and Eastern European partners. She has previously worked for NATO performing long-term data-driven analysis of media and Russian disinformation. So, Beta, floor is yours. And, Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Vilnius Security Forum, and I'm your moderator, Beata Patashova, on this discussion uh, on regulated and unrestricted warfare. And I would like to take a moment to thank the organizers, National Defense Foundation, and the Lietuvos Respublika Seimas for making today's discussion possible. Uh, first, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today on this panel. Uh, together with me here, we have, first of all, Dr. Hans Binerdik, uh, right here. He's a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council, adjunct political scientist at the RAND Corporation, and he previously served at the National Security Council and held uh, high positions in the U.S. government. Uh, then we have Yulia uh, Kadzobina, the head of Ukrainian Foundation for Security Studies of Information Policy, Information and Cybersecurity. And we have Mr. Apo Sederberg, uh, CEO of uh, CyberWatch Finland, 
Uh, he's also an associate fellow with the Global Fellowship Initiative at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And finally, Dr. Uh, Asta Maskeluneta, who is the director of the Department of Political and Strategic Studies in the Baltic Defense College. So first, I would like to start by saying that the security crisis we face today, whether stemming from state actors, terrorist groups, or other non-state actors, are increasingly defined by seemingly infinite combination of methods, targets, and tools. Actors seek to operate in the gray zone or even fabricate uh, the gray zones to operate outside the law of armed conflict and international humanitarian law. For instance, the Kremlin absurdly calls its war against Ukraine the largest, which is the largest conventional war in Europe since the World War II. It calls it a special military operation. And as it does this, Russian Federation armed forces strike civilian targets and infrastructure in a barbaric attempt to pressure civilian population. Similarly, terrorist groups and non-state actors have integrated new technologies to their attack planning and methods, diversifying the avenues through which they can attack military and civilian targets. But they are not alone in presenting more threat vectors. States that operate in open or in the gray zone of armed conflict are combining every manner of tool, whether it be armed proxies, cyber economic pressure, conventional military forces, or any other tools at their disposal. These trends in total create a security environment that is defined but by what we are here to discuss today. Meaningly, increasingly unregulated and unrestricted nature of warfare. In our time where groups and states seek to operate outside of established norms and mix methods and tools in seemingly infinite ways. So with this, I would like to start the discussion and I give the floor to uh, Dr. Benedict. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be back here uh, in Vilnius. Uh, uh, for a relatively small country, Lithuania um, has had a very significant impact on the alliance uh, and its leadership in the alliance, and it's therefore quite fitting that the NATO summit will be held here uh, this summer. Uh, what I would like to do uh, in the 15 minutes that I have is two things. Uh, one, I'd like to give you kind of a strategic assessment uh, from uh, Washington, at least one person's view from Washington. What is the nature of the world that we're living in now? And then secondly, uh, based on that, looking to the Vilnius summit, uh, suggest a few things that I think will be important to watch for, some of which have already been mentioned here this morning. So first, uh, what is... Uh, the strategic assessment uh, from Washington, at least mine from Washington. Uh, I, would, I would say that the threat environment is deteriorating. Um, we are seeing the rise of uh, major power competition, um, major power threat, um, and we have seen the failure of deterrence, and that's a very difficult combination. Uh, that, in turn, has strengthened our alliances, and we have all watched uh, the bravery uh, of our um, partners in Ukraine, and I have a few thoughts on uh, lessons learned, or at least lessons observed uh, from that war. So let me begin with the major power threat. Uh, we spent a couple of decades uh, after 9-11 focusing very much on counterterrorism. That began to change uh, in 2014. By 2018, the U.S. national security strategy uh, under the Trump administration was focusing on major power challenges. Uh, and this is one of the areas where the Biden administration really picked up uh, the focus of the Trump administration to deal with those major power threats. This is primarily Russia and China, but it's also uh, the rogue states uh, with North Korea and Iran, as already mentioned. Uh, let me begin with Russia. The uh, national security strategy says that Russia uh, is an acute threat, acute threat. That means it's a threat now. It's something you have to focus on now. We are fighting a proxy war with Russia. Um, but Russia, the, the 
The scope of the Russian challenge, the Russian threat, is narrow. It's basically military. Uh, and maybe a little cyber, we'll hear from that later. But Russia uh, is a declining power over time. That doesn't make it, actually, it makes it perhaps more dangerous. Um, um, I cannot imagine a situation where Russia under Putin is anything uh, but a pariah state, and they will remain so uh, as long as um, the current leadership in the Kremlin is there. Um, then you have China. Uh, I think it's a mistake to lump Russia and China together. Uh, they, they have a lot of similarities. They're run by autocrats. Uh, they have uh, claims on sovereign territory of other nations. Um, they, uh, in different ways, want to challenge or overthrow the liberal international order. But they're very different countries. Uh, China is, in our national security strategy, uh, listed as the pacing challenge or even the pacing threat. Uh, that means that, in terms of our military, we need to be able to deal with that threat because it's more dangerous over time. It's also China as a, uh, an increasingly very wealthy nation with a lot of technology represents a much fuller spectrum of threats than does Russia. Uh, so I think as we, as we think about these uh, major power challenges and threats, we need to remember that they, uh, the, the nature of that threat is different. Uh, Russia and China uh, have, on several occasions in the last year or so, tried to strengthen their own relationship. We saw the No Limits uh, pledge uh, just before the Ukraine war started. Uh, we just had the meeting in Moscow where Xi basically was trying to throw Putin a political lifeline. Uh, but I do think that uh, Xi is not happy with Putin right now. Uh, there, uh, China is uh, supporting Russia's rhetoric on the war, but they're not providing weapons. Uh, even the Siberia uh, uh, pipeline that was supposed to be coming out of that meeting, um, Power of Siberia 2, that did not proceed. Um, Xi is constantly, publicly telling Putin, don't, you, don't threaten nuclear use. Um, so there are differences, and frankly, I think uh, we would be wise if we tried to exploit those differences, drive wedges between these two major powers wherever we can. Um, so with this major power focus and with uh, both North Korea and Iran aligning themselves with the autocratic states, uh, providing weapons to Russia now, uh, what kind of a world is that? Uh, Russia and China say they want a multipolar world. We've left the unipolar world a long time ago. The danger is that this world becomes more bipolar, and that's where we're headed uh, with the democracies and the autocracies. And if you look at history, you will find, uh, setting aside the Cold War, that bipolar systems uh, can be very dangerous. They generally lead to war. Uh, and so we have to keep that in mind uh, as we think about the nature of the international system and the way we deal with these powers. I think we need to do whatever we can to try to, as I said, drive wedges uh, between Russia and China. So that's the first point, major powers. Second point is uh, the failure of deterrence. This has already been discussed this morning. Uh, it failed and it failed uh, in, in uh, great magnitude. Um, Russia gave Ukraine assurances 30 years ago uh, with the Budapest Memorandum. They violated all of those assurances. They, it's interesting to go back and read that. They, they pledged to, res to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and never to use force. They have broken both of those pledges. So assurances are not a good deterrent. Uh, threat of economic and other sanctions. Uh, Russia, I think, felt that they could divide 
the West on sanctions, uh, but clearly economic sanctions did not deter. Uh, and Russia has found ways around many of these sanctions by shifting their markets, uh, by following monetary policies that stabilize the ruble. And so sanctions are not a particular, economic sanctions are not a particularly useful deterrent. Partnerships. NATO, if you look back at that last 20 or so years of NATO-Ukraine relations, uh, partnership for peace, uh, uh, we have the NATO-Ukraine Commission, uh, we have um, uh, Ukraine as an enhanced opportunity partner, uh, we had the 2008 uh, Bucharest uh, summit language, they will become members of NATO, none of that has worked. So partnerships, partnerships are not a particularly good deterrent. So we have seen the failure of all of those instruments. We talk a lot about integrated deterrence as a national policy, which means you use all of your instruments to try to deter. Most of those instruments don't work. Um, nuclear deterrence, just very briefly. Uh, we have a problem with uh, nuclear deterrence. Uh, the INF Treaty has failed. Start two is on hold. Uh, Russia has uh, a, a fairly dominant position if you're looking at the non-strategic uh, systems. And um, we have seen Russian threats. We've seen Russian escalate to de-escalate doctrine. This is all very dangerous. And on top of that, you have the growth of Chinese programs. So we have a problem with nuclear deterrence as well. So the lesson from all of this uh, is um, you need firm agreements and you need troops on the ground to deter. Uh, the rest of it hasn't worked very well. Third point, um, because of what I've just discussed, our alliances have gained strength and that's kind of the savior in this whole thing. NATO is stronger than ever. Uh, we've already mentioned Sweden and Finland coming in, uh, but the unity uh, that we showed at Madrid with the new strategic concept, um, with an array of very creative ideas for enhancing our deterrence, the already mentioned movement to deterrence by denial. Um, this has all strengthened uh, the alliance. And within that alliance and uh, the broader uh, contact group, the 54 nations who are providing weapons to Ukraine, it's been, one can argue that it's been slow and it has been. Uh, one can argue that it's sort of just in time uh, provision of weapons, that's true. But nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, uh, we have been able to give Ukraine just in time uh, what it needs to defend itself. Uh, if you look at uh, the committed and approved and in the pipeline uh, military equipment for Ukraine coming from the West, uh, there, these figures are all over the place because of the nature of, of how you do the accounting, but roughly $90 billion uh, has, has, has gone or, or is in the pipeline. Uh, $60 billion or so of that is American, the other 30 uh, is European. So Europe has done its part, it needs to do more, but this just demonstrates the unity uh, that we have seen over the last year or so. Uh, we don't see that we don't focus in Europe perhaps as much on the fact that the same thing is happening in Asia. America's Asian allies are stepping up. They have seen what's happening in Ukraine. They worry about Taiwan. Japan is doubling, doubling in the next five years. That's what they say they're going to do, I believe it. Their defense spending from 1% to 2% of GDP. That's a major, major event. Uh, you have uh, South Korea cooperating as they never have before with Japan, given their history. That's new. It's good news. Uh, you have the AUKUS agreement with the United States uh, strengthening uh, Australia. You have the Quad, where we're bringing uh, India in as best we can. You have uh, a whole set of new base arrangements with the Philippines. Uh, and you have the Vietnamese, who want to be America's best friend. So what we're seeing in Europe, strengthening of alliances, we're seeing in Asia as well. 
we have to figure out how to connect these two things, Europe and Asia, and we're beginning to do that. Um, so in response to this deteriorating uh, uh, strategic environment, uh, the good news in all of this is that the alliances are stepping up. Let me make a couple of observations about the Ukraine war because I think it may change the way we fight in the future. And I'll do this quickly. Um, a key element is the determination, the uh, adapt uh, adaptability uh, of the Ukrainian people, their resilience, and their military. If I had to pick one factor uh, in all of this, that would be it, uh, as, they, uh, uh, as they have defended their country. Um, and the importance, again, of allied unity to that. But we see at the more tactical and operational level the importance of uh, precision strike weapons, especially when connected to exquisite operational uh, useful intelligence. That combination of precision strike and actionable intelligence has really shifted the focus on the battlefield. There are very few modern Russian tanks on the battlefield right now. Uh, their uh, air power, at least fighter aircraft, have been neutralized to a large degree by air defenses. More needs to be done. Uh, same thing is true of the Russian Navy. They've been pushed back. So we see that these major battle platforms uh, are becoming increasingly vulnerable. And that may change the way we think uh, about uh, defense in the future. Um, I'll just add one more. There are a whole bunch of other things I could add, but I'll just add one more, and that's sustainability. We see that the uh, rate at which artillery uh, shells are being used, uh, some 90,000 a month, way exceeds what uh, we can produce. So what that tells you in the long run is that there's going to have to be a greater focus on sustainability and having these stocks available. Let me turn with that strategic assessment uh, to the Vilnius summit and just make four sets of points, and I'll do this very quickly. Um, first of all, <laughs> uh, um, we'll be perhaps choosing a new Secretary General. I think Stoltenberg has done an amazing job of keeping the alliance together. If we could find a way not to change riders in the middle of this uh, war that we're fighting by proxy, um, we should find a way to keep him. Um, and of course, Sweden and Finland uh, hopefully will come in after the Turkish elections uh, in May. But the four issues I wanted to address first we have to figure out how to maintain the unity that we have on Ukraine and to, go, and to go a bit further. We need to figure out here at Vilnius uh, this summer uh, what kind of a pledge we can make for weapons as long as it takes. If Russia hears that, they may understand uh, that, that they can't wait us out and they can't divide us. Uh, and then secondly, uh, already raised, um, what is the next step that we could take here at the summit to eventually bring Ukraine into NATO. We can't do it now. Uh, as long as there is a war on, we can't do it. But when we can agree on what the borders are that we are going to defend, uh, there will come a point where the Bucharest language will kick in. Uh, and we have to start thinking now about that. And at the summit, I'd like to see how we could take a couple of additional steps towards that end. Secondly, deterrence by denial. NATO has done a great deal of thinking about how to do this. Um, and the trick here at Vilnius this summer will be to implement it. Um, we have uh, uh, readiness initiatives, mobility initiatives. We have a new force model. Uh, we have um, a new NATO warfighting concept. We have the enhanced forward deterrence, and we need to do much more uh, there. So all these, these ideas are out there, uh, pretty much agreed to, but we've got to implement them, and we've got to implement them quickly, and I think that's what Vilnius, the Vilnius Summit uh, should uh, be about. And incidentally, I think we also ought to call at Vilnius for a review of our nuclear posture. Um, there are some real problems. Third, and I'll do this quickly, at Madrid, the Alliance came up with some very useful language 
on China. That now has to be implemented um, uh, from um, um, uh, dealing with the vulnerabilities that they present to partnerships with Asian allies. And then finally, finally, um, there's this lingering burden sharing issue on the one side, on the other side it's uh, strategic autonomy. We have to set both of those notions aside and think about strategic responsibility, Europe's strategic responsibility. I think the commitment of the United States to NATO is extremely solid under this administration. Uh, we saw under the Trump administration that it was weakened. Um, we have another election coming up in a couple of years. And we can also envision a situation in which the United States may be engaged in military activity in Asia. Uh, and the focus will be on that. And that may mean that the United States is not as able as Europe might like to bring in reinforcements. So for those reasons, the old burden sharing argument was this. We have to, Washington has to be happy that, the United, that Europe is doing its peace. That's no longer a valid argument. Now it should be Europe needs to do more to defend itself. It's in your interest. It's about you. It's not about keeping Washington happy. So with that, went over a little bit, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, just one cle uh, quick clarification. When we talk about the failure of deterrence, it's important to mention that it's not NATO deterrence that has failed because none of NATO allies have been attacked, obviously, and NATO has been the most successful alliance precisely for this reason. And we will discuss deterrence uh, extensively in the next panel, in fact. So now I would like to give the floor to Yulia. Yulia, please. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to start with uh, actually thanking for all these words of support uh, 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 that uh, have been said here for Ukraine and all the uh, recognition of uh, Ukraine's role in uh, uh, providing for Ukraine's security in these difficult times. I think we are very grateful to hear that and it's very important to us to, that uh, our contribution is uh, being acknowledged. Um, I, was, I would actually uh, like to start with the same point that uh, Beata just made, that uh, I actually don't think that deterrence uh, in, uh, in this case, the deterrence actually really failed because Ukraine was not a part of the European security system at the time uh, when Russia launched its uh, war on Ukraine. And so I think I'm absolutely confident that this is one of the reasons why this attack was possible, because when Putin was making his calculation of whether or not to attack Ukraine, he uh, could see that uh, the position the U.S. was taking was, okay, we're not going to interfere directly. Uh, also, there was a lot of conversation about um, difficulties within the NATO alliance and uh, all the talk about uh, NATO being brain dead and things like that. So uh, most likely Putin did not expect uh, NATO to respond and to actually uh, get behind uh, Ukraine if uh, he attacks Ukraine. So. Basically, when he was making the calculation whether or not to attack, he definitely had uh, like no expectation that Ukraine was going to be uh, supported, and Ukraine on its own definitely is a lot uh, weaker than Russia, and so uh, he probably expected it to be a easy, uh, easy target. And um, but the reason for that is that you, because Ukraine was not a part of the uh, European uh, security system. So, um, when we talk about the current situation, I was actually asked to, to prepare remarks for uh, to talk about like U U Ukrainian European integration and uh, U Ukrainian NATO integration. So, but apparently the discussion is, is in a little, going a little bit different way. So I had to kind of uh, uh, change on the way. And so there are several points I would uh, uh, still uh, like to make. So one of them is. Uh, that at this point, defeating Russia is absolutely essential if we want to achieve peace uh, in the European continent. Because if we're looking at what's uh, happening, what the reason of uh, the current war is, is basically that a stronger power uh, that's uh, seeking to uh, uh, satisfy its imperial ambitions, it's willing to use uh, force against a weaker power, right, to challenge the international system and to challenge the international 
uh, order. And so if we, but uh, international order is basically all these principles that are uh, in the basis of this international order, they are very important for actually living in peace. You know? So if you respect your neighbor's borders, then you live in peace. If you are willing to uh, resolve your conflicts peacefully, then you live in peace, right? If you're not willing to use uh, force uh, for conflict resolution. So, um, and uh, when we are talking about uh, the war in Ukraine, it's really important to understand that we're also defending uh, these principles. And so then uh, the question becomes, uh, how do you defeat Russia and what constitutes uh, Russian defeat in this war? And we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, Ukraine, Ukrainian victory being, um, uh, Ukraine regaining control of its uh, 1991 borders, and uh, I agree with this, but I think we can flip this question and ask, so what would constitute uh, Russian defeat in this war? And uh, in my opinion, actually, uh, Ukraine NATO's membership is going to be kind of the full uh, and final uh, defeat of Russia in this war, because preventing uh, Ukraine from joining the alliance, and this is sort of a uh, test for Russia, for its ability to still be in control and to still call the shots and still uh, like get its uh, will to, to prevail. And uh, I understand all the uh, kind of concerns of uh, the Western countries and uh, concerns about escalation, but I think we uh, have seen so far that yes, Russia does not escalate based on what the West does. And also we've seen on many, uh, on many occasions then when Russia is met with uh, an overwhelming uh, a resolute response, then it backs down. You know, many people believe that uh, Putin will never back down, but Russia does back down, and we've seen that in uh, several cases in this world already, right, when they started uh, attacking from all different directions, and then uh, Ukraine, Ukraine started uh, fighting back, and so then they decided, okay, we're going away from all these areas in the north of the, north of the country, and uh, we're concentrating on the east. And so, uh, and there, there have been some uh, other instances as well. And so I absolutely believe that uh, if we want to defeat Russia, on the one hand, we have to be more resolute. We, we have to stop talking about uh, the fear of escalation uh, because uh, uh, the, the way uh, Russian leaders currently think, it's, uh, they, they, they are they're believers in uh, um, the, the, the power, like, the, sorry, I forget. <laughs> might makes right, right? So that's, uh, that's their way of thinking. And so if you are willing to show your strength, uh, they will uh, take that into consideration and, and they will not be as assertive as they are. And also, if you're looking at most of their actions, I understand that, you know, their atrocities and uh, uh, their willingness to violate the rules, they have the psychological effect that, okay, they're unpredictable, you don't really understand what to expect of them, and uh, uh, that kind of breeds this uh, feeling of uh, fear and security, and uh, you really don't, and makes you uh, unwilling to respond forcefully. But uh, if you really look at what they've done uh, so far, a lot of it was not uh, that risky. You know, like attacking Ukraine from their uh, point of view was not risky because Ukraine was supposed to be an easy target. If you look at uh, uh, the aggression that they uh, uh, commi commit um, against uh, Western countries, and, and I mean like information aggression, and I mean uh, all these incidents like in the air and uh, at sea, uh, they never, uh, those are usually uh, under the threshold. And so understanding that uh, Russia has a nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons and that will deter uh, Western readiness to um, engage with them. Uh, so they, they, they do these things, but they, uh, those are not really risky to them because they know that they're not going to hit back. And that's uh, a, part, uh, a part of their game. And so, uh, coming back to the question, how do you defeat Russia? I think in this case, we also need to uh, look more um, 
going to use their thinking. So their, their, their thinking is, okay, you look for vulnerabilities in your adversaries and you exploit those vulnerabilities. And uh, when we look at Russia, uh, Russia is an authoritarian state and uh, I think it's uh, vulnerable, for example, to uh, dealing with many issues at the same time. So if there is only one person making decisions and everybody else is not uh, authorized to make decisions, then the more issues you have arise, the more difficult it's going to uh, for you to uh, deal with those issues. And so I believe that uh, not, uh, what needs to be done is not only concentrate on uh, the battlefield and fighting on defeating Ukrainian army or Russian army in Ukraine, but also um, trying to raise multiple other issues. Because um, uh, Russia has issues, for, like, for example, with Japan. Russia has issues with uh, other uh, countries that used to be a part of uh, the Soviet Union. So. Raising those issues, and uh, that's also going to have uh, a domestic effect uh, on Russia because uh, one of the main reasons Putin is uh, able to stay in power in Russia is he, he appears to be this really strong leader. There is no, um, uh, no alternative to him, and he is in control, right? But if, when these things start happening, it's going to undermine his uh, standing at home as well. Uh, so we're, uh, in, in terms of uh, where the situation is going, so currently it uh, looks like uh, Russia's uh, losing steam at the battlefield and Ukraine's preparing for the counteroffensive. Uh, at this point, we don't really know how far this counteroffensive is going to go, but after that, most likely, uh, we should expect uh, some sort of a, uh, at least like a stalemate, right? So the uh, we, hopefully Ukraine's going to go far enough, uh, maybe not. And so uh, I think after that, uh, to, um, I, I know that Western countries are really reluctant uh, to th even think about uh, accepting uh, Ukraine into NATO uh, before the end of the war, but I think that this is actually an option that needs to be considered and it needs to be considered uh, seriously because that way the West will signal to Russia that uh, its full weight is behind uh, Ukraine. And actually Ukraine is already uh, integrating in terms of its uh, like military capacities. We're already using um, Western weapons. We're already uh, like training our uh, Western countries are helping to train our soldiers according to NATO standards. And if we're talking about the political part, uh, Ukraine is also undertaking European integration at the same time as it's undertaking NATO uh, uh, NATO sort of like by fact integration. And also there is a really really strong support uh, inside of Ukraine for both. Uh, NATO integration, the European integration, it's currently at 86 and 87 uh, percent, if, if I remember correctly. So it's, uh, there's also like a really, really strong domestic push for, um, for integration. And uh, so it's uh, like, and if Ukraine is uh, made official NATO candidate and also if uh, Ukraine starts negotiating with the European Union, it's going to give another impetus to uh, domestic civil society because uh, in uh, some cases uh, the view is okay, well, they don't really want us. But if there is a, this is a really clear signal that uh, you want us, it's going to be an additional impetus for Ukrainian civil society to push for more reforms and for changes. And also it's going to be a signal for Russia that uh, uh, Ukraine really is moving in this direction. And, um, and another point is that um, uh, Russian capabilities uh, are not going to change depending on these uh, basically symbolic moves. And so uh, which, what is important for uh, uh, this uh, for, for, for Ukraine, it's, it's not going to either uh, increase or decrease Russia's capability, capabilities. And so we should look at uh, Russia's escalation options and uh, see whether we can deter those and also understand that even uh, if Ukraine uh, gets to its borders and if Russia stays intact, uh, Russia's aggression was... Uh, something that was motivated by its uh, internal factors and uh, most likely uh, it will continue, but most likely if uh, Ukraine is a part of NATO, most likely it will not want to fight NATO just like it doesn't want to fight NATO now, but it will continue uh, all of these uh, efforts uh, in the gray zone. And so 
uh, in a world like this, it's uh, important to understand your own vulnerabilities and also important to understand uh, the instruments that Russia uses to get at those vulnerabilities. And uh, I mean the, uh, the, these instruments that are part of uh, Russian active measures approach. So now that uh, all the technology, that all the social media that made it a lot easier for them, the messengers and uh, you know the, the thing that Ukraine has to deal with, uh, Telegram Messenger, which uh, you don't really have communication with them. And so the, what's happening there, nobody really has any control. Uh, unlike, for example, Facebook or Twitter, where you can at least have some communication with uh, the people who run them. So, like cyber, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to talk to, on cyber. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I have some other uh, specialists on this issue in uh, my organization, but I'm not an expert in cyber. So, uh, but uh, that's also another thing. Uh, we understand that the internet was not built with uh, security in mind, and so we really need to think on how to protect ourselves from uh, possible uh, Russian misuse of uh, this uh, information technology. And uh, I don't think there is really an alternative. Uh, I know that there are lots of uh, kind of uh, apprehension about uh, the world becoming bipolar, but I don't think it's uh, a kind of our, our choice, right? Uh, there have been many instances when Western countries uh, showed uh, their willingness to work with Russia. And you know, if you even think back to the start of the Cold War, why did it start? Not because the West didn't want uh, to have good relations with Russia after the war, but because uh, there were certain views right on the part of uh, uh, Stalin at that time and uh, his willingness to assert his views. And again, uh, after the Cold War, the West was willing to uh, bring Russia, so to speak, into the fold. It didn't work. Why? Not because of uh, what the West was doing, right? But just because Russia is distrustful and so. Uh, the world is becoming um, bipolar, but it's not uh, the choice of the West. And I think, again, bringing Ukraine uh, into into the Western uh, world is kind of expanding its uh, uh, making making it bigger. And I think that's that it should be done. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Yulia, for providing the Ukrainian perspective. Uh, just to add, uh, since it was uh, mentioned, indeed NATO allies continue supporting Ukraine, and so far they provided over 65 billion euros of military support. And uh, now I hope we can move to cyber threats <laughs> and regulation uh, in the cyberspace. Please, Apo. Thank you very much, Anne, and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here and, and address this distinguished audience. And um, I don't go directly to cyber, although you are appealing to, but, but just to make an uh, evaluation of the current situation as the previous speakers. So from the Finnish perspective, of course, uh, we have been considering Russia as, as a military threat uh, throughout the decades and, and been fighting against the Soviet and Russia in the history many times. At the same time, in, 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 in uh, the near future, we also consider Russia to be a great uh, opportunity for, for, for the economic uh, side and, and, and try to, in a way, use that tool. That failed and, and, and we wa wanted to give the signal to, together with Sweden and apply the NATO, NATO membership, which is actually, I think, is more the symbolic behind this that, that we are reacting on the Russian aggression and, and we want to, to rise the level of deterrence and, and we want, want to uh, have, a, have a better prevention against their military aggression. At the same time, it, it's, it's clear if, if we are accepted to NATO, and, and hopefully very soon, the, then the main defenders in the future will be the Finns. So Finland will be defended by the Finns because we have the long border with the Russia and, and uh, they, they, they have a lot of military potential on, on, on our, our neighboring area. And, and that's how we have been living with them and, and, and uh, all the time um, mon monitoring what, what, what they, they are doing. And our concept has been uh, credible defense. And now the question is, in the future, what is a credible defense? Because we know that uh, the only thing the Russians respect is power. So what kind of power is needed in, in, in the future? 
The first thing is, of course, the military power. And, and if I, I'm, I'm look, look, looking now, now, what is the future threat and warfare, of the concept of Russia going to be in the future? So they are, basically, we have to be prepared to three type of wars, conventional war, hybrid war, and cyber war. Okay, so hybrid war and cyber war, they have perhaps the new elements, and, and I think that's the main focus of this panel, to discuss what is needed. In terms of the con conventional military power, of course, uh, it, 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 it's clear that it's not any more the same, but, but you need more technology and, and you need cyber capacities and you need cyber power and, and then, then you need strong defense will. As we see in Ukraine, the defense will is very de decisive. It's in many cases is much stronger than the weapons. And, and that, that's of course traditional we, we have had in, in, in Finland. And then the military wisdom, I would say, is you have to know your enemy. Do we know what the Russians are doing in the future? We have to be able to forecast. I think something what, what is a lesson learned that we have to, we, 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 we have to, to uh, rely that what they, they are stating is true. 2018, they said that the war in future is going to be a hybrid war and a new generation war. What does it mean in practice? Crimean operation, it was a hybrid operation. They have done it in Syria and, and, and so on and so forth. They have been successful. Then they started the new generation war one year ago. And then they, ha they are failing all the time. So, so this concept, and, and looking now at the war, war from my, my old military eyes, it's not very successful. They are losing all the time. Luckily, they are losing all the time because, because the, the, the situation awareness was uh, wrong and they made a strategic mistake uh, undermining the capacity of, 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 of U Ukraine. And looking now at the situation in Europe, so we see that the, the war is going in Ukraine and the hybrid war is going against the West, and between the West and, and, and the Russians. So, so they are all the time using asymmetric means uh, to, to try, try to, to, to have an impact to our, our societies. And, and the the goal of the Russian hybrid warfare is to create chaos and have an impact to political decision making in, in, in the target countries. We are facing that every day. We see and we have seen in Europe a lot, a lot of cyber, cyber attacks to the critical infra, information operation every time when there's an election and it's going all, 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 the, all the time. So we have to understand what is the hybrid warfare concept of, of, of Russia. So, in, in, uh, as, as I, they, they say themselves in, in, in the new generation warfare, the main focus is in the military like it's in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But in, in the hybrid warfare, the main focus and main capabilities are the asymmetric means. And they are you, you used in a way that you always can make a surprise to, 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 to your target. And this, this is what is happening all the time. So this is everyday life. And perhaps the, the thing is that the media is giving a little, a little bit wrong picture. We are focusing on, 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 the, on the real war in Ukraine, but we don't see what is happening on the hybrid arena in, in, in a way in Europe. And, and of course, we are looking at it in fin Finland very carefully and, and seeing what they are trying to do. And there we have, have cyber information the operations, we have the energy weapon, we, we have the economical weapons, and, and then, then we have many, many others like, like, like uh, using refugees and every possible means. Every time the concept is different, so it's, very, it's much more difficult to build the hybrid defense than to build the conventional defense. So the question is, how, what is a hybrid defense? 
And our concept is the comprehensive security approach in, in Finland. We started in 1962 to educate all our, our politicians, members of parliament and, and highest level authorities and the, the, the directors of the private sector. They, they are doing three, three weeks course together and playing war games. And, and they, that's a huge network. That, that's the mindset. That, 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 that's really the, the enabler of, of the whole of society approach. So the hybrid defense is a whole of society approach because simply the target for hybrid op operations is not the military target only, but it's also the main target at the civilian side. So how, what are the vulnerabilities in, in people's mind and heart and, and our critical infra? So that's something, and luckily we have been successful in this because uh, this is based on our, our traditional total defense concept, which was actually to help the military to win the war. But now the main aim is, is to keep the society run, running and build resilience through the society. So that's the key, how to build the resilience through the society. Because the target in hybrid operations, yeah, it's, it's the society. Then the third element is the cyber war, which is more, of course, blurry, and, and we can't really see what is happening in, in the digital environment. But we all are lo looking to, to get welfare from the digitalization, so, so, and, and when we want digitalization, there we will get cyber attacks to us. So what is, what is the Russian cyber power? Are they good or bad? I think it's, 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 it's a good question and, and, and a thousand dollars question as we say. So, so the problem here is that, that it's not only the official and the German intelligence organizations have ranked the Russian official governmental cyber power to be the, the fourth best in the world, uh, China is by the, by the way the first one and then US, but, but this is of course one ranking. But then it's not only the, the governmental power, then it's the APT groups, it's the criminals. And Russia, we know that Mark Kalinotti has uh, written a good book about uh, the criminal culture of, of Russia, so, so it's also in, in, in the sci cyber, so it's very blurry. And we see the, the, the incidents, we see the offense, but they can be done by, by the criminals because it's then you can deny that it's not us, it, it's the crimi criminals. So, so it's very hard to evaluate the cyber power from Russia. But I, what they are doing now, their main focus is in cyber spionage. They, they are they're figuring out and, 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 and also updating their, their target libraries in every every Western country, because if need be, like when Finland is, is getting into NATO, they might have, uh, they, they might want to, 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 to uh, punish us, and, and then they, perhaps the most uh, likely punishment is, is a, a huge cyber operation against fin Finland. So, and there you need the intelligence. And that's why the cyber power in Russian concept, it, it's very closely working together with their military intelligence, with, 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 with their, their other intelligence, FSP and uh, SVR. So, so, so they have their state power, they have their criminal power, and, and they can be mobilized. And, and now in Russia they are changing their le legislation that, that uh, the cyber crime is not a criminal act, act if it's uh, beneficial for the state. Okay, so how do we then this is Russia. We know that there is power and, and, and there is potential which haven't been used because they have been waiting the right moment, I would say. And we, we never know when it's the right moment. It might be in the near future. And, and of course, they have been boosting their, their efforts on, on the cyberspace. Then what, what is the cyber defense? So Finland is fine with, with, with our conventional defense. We call it credible defense. It's good enough to, to have the deterrence high, hybrid defense. We know that the comprehensive security system is good and, and it's also having the deterrence pretty high so you can't destroy the Finnish civil society. It's going to be a very hard task. Then what about cyber? Are we good enough? And I would say here is, is perhaps 
an area where had, we have to do more. And looking now to U.S. concept, so so U.S. Uh, just uh, just um, ad adapted their new cyber strategy, and U.K. has done a bit a bit the same concept that that the, the old methods are not anymore enough in cyberspace. We need new methods. Question is, what are the new methods? And I agree with the US, U.S. concept that we have to uh, build the cyber power through which we are ab able to weaken the, the Russian cyber power. It's, it's a preventive act. And, and when I was um, heading the group, when we did uh, ten, 10 years ago the first Finnish cyber strategy, so it was forbidden to, to say that, that Finland needs officer, uh, offensive cyber capacities. But this is a must in the future. And there, there we have to go. Otherwise, we are not credible. And there we, we have to say that our concept. And looking what is the NATO cyber concept, it says that, that uh, it's, it's, it's based on the national capacities and it's very much open that the, the nations have to build their cyber power. And roughly half of the NATO countries, they, they have offensive uh, uh, capacities on, on the cyber power. So here is an area where we all, as, as uh, ally, uh, alliances, have, have to, to do more. And, and here is perhaps, um, uh, be, be, perhaps um, uh, an area where we have to boost our, our, our cooperation. Okay, so in the future, it's always said that the generals are preparing for, for the previous war, so if we want to prepare for the new one, then, then we have to build three kinds of defense, and we might see, see a, a conventional war uh, against F Finland, we might see a hybrid war, war against fin Finland or cy cyber operations, or then it can be the mixture of all those. So. The future is, is uh, definitely it's more blurry than it has been, been in the past. So then how to, how, what is the response, how, how to predict, how to forecast? So, so as, as uh, my, my colleague here mentioned, the intelligence information is, is, is the key. It's crucial. And actually looking at uh, what, what has perhaps been the biggest contribution to Ukraine, I don't underestimate the fighters and, and, and tanks because I'm an old, old, old colonel, so, so it, 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 it's fine. But actually, lo looking to, at the operational le level, so if, if you have the right intelligence information, then you can be the winner. So that's something, that's really an area where we have to be able to do more on national level and, and, the, and, and, and the level, level, level of or partnerships and, and, and uh, alliances. The other thing is, is of course, that, that, that we, we, we have to not just put our main focus on information operations, how, how, to, how, how to, to, to find out what the Russians are doing, but then how we in the future, how we keep the defense will high in all the countries, because that's anyway, that's the greatest assets, it's always the people behind and, and there is a lot to be done. But I think this was in, enough for the beginning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chapo. And now Asta, please. Okay, thank you very much and thank you for the organizers for inviting me. Let me take one moment uh, to advertise my institution, Baltic Defense College, which is the most successful common defense project that we have in the Baltic uh, countries. And in addition to teaching officers of uh, the rank major and up in our courses, you can find also uh, my colleagues here with uh, some advertisement of uh, also our research in which we try to enhance our knowledge on the, the Baltic um, region security and defense and also uh, some understanding on Russia. So we brought um, with us the, the, our latest issue of proceedings of Russia conference called the winter of uh, Russian discontent and you are free to take a copy uh, outside after the panel. Okay, but get, getting back to, um, to our um, topics of, of this panel, so I have really difficult time speaking the last, as I can see, maybe just I agree and we can move on to discussion. Um, but okay, I will, I will try to say a couple of words uh, still uh, about the topics. So um, 
when, when I looked uh, at the panel name, this unrestricted and unregulated warfare, I was, um, as um, a social scientist, I'm starting to pick, uh, pick up the, on, on the words instantly and uh, to look what, what, what that uh, can mean. So, of course, it, uh, it brings also this notion, and, and I think uh, initially the panel uh, also had that, uh, that notion even in the title of uh, total war. So, for that, what you need is, uh, as, as we know from, um, uh, from some distilling by some more clever people than me, that you need what? Total aims, total methods, in, particularly in disregard of uh, international law. Uh, total mobilization on one side and centralized uh, total control. So if we look at uh, the situation that we have, well, if you take Ukraine, then of course their aim is total because they are fighting for survival. The mobilization on their side is probably also total, but uh, the two other elements are probably missing. On the Western side, we do hope that they have a total aim, though that's not always visible. Uh, means are kind of um, probably far from total. And uh, the other two elements are also missing. And now then, probably Russia would be the one waging this uh, total war. But even in that case, we see, yes, the total aims, genocidal aims, but uh, the means which are uh, not entirely adequate to, uh, to, that, uh, to that task, with the attempts at control, which are also seemingly half-hearted, as uh, everybody was waiting for already a year for them to uh, announce the uh, war situation or uh, go um, ever uh, further in, um, in trying to contain their, their population close the borders and so on. And um, we see very little attempt to, to actually mobilize um, uh, the society there as, as well. So it's kind of waging this um, uh, war with total aims, but, um, but so that very few people would notice, which is not entirely how um, we used to see the total war. But, um, of course, they are using some of the elements, and uh, here I will um, uh, want to, to um, address something in, in which I'm uh, maybe more uh, even comfortable. Uh, this um, aspect of some, um, some, some of the means that are being used that look very much like, um, like terrorism, with which we were dealing with uh, for for quite, uh, quite a while now, and had it in our focus for quite a while. So, um, as, uh, as my colleague here uh, mentioned, uh, it's, um, well, militaries are often preparing to fight the last war, but there is an opposite tendency as well that uh, um, the, everything that has been learned tends to be discarded when some new uh, problem comes into focus. But I think we can, uh, we can use um, quite a lot of what, what actually we learned over the last uh, 25 years on how, um, how, um, how terrorism works in this situation um, as well. Because in, in a sense, well, um, yes, uh, it's incomparable, the, the means that some terrorist organizations and the huge state as Russia have at their disposal. But when they start using um, attacks on, uh, on uh, civilians on, uh, and that with uh, trying to intimidate um, the government to change its course, um, this is something that we are very familiar with from, um, from, from the past. And we also know that uh, quite typically this, uh, this approach um, has an opposite effect and it does not work. And uh, it is very kind of uh, thankful, of course, that um, um, there is very little uh, chance of success of this, um, of this approach. 
Um, but at the same time, the problem is that it takes a lot of time for people themselves to realize that their, their approach is, is not working. Um, and um, one of the reasons of that is that um, um, they, they have, um, human beings in general are not very good with statistics. They prefer outliers and they think that if a million people winning, um, trying to play lottery will never win a million, that doesn't mean that they are not that person who will not win a million, yes? And, and this is how they are behaving in, in many other uh, situations as well. So, um, um, taking a certain strategy, there is also a tendency to go in such a way that, okay, it didn't work first time, it didn't work a second time, but maybe after the 56th uh, time, it will work. What to do with that? Well, um, as again we have learned from our long engagement with our previous uh, foes, is uh, patience. Yes, that's, you need a lot of patience and uh, perseverance. And you need what, again, my colleagues were mentioning already, intelligence and focus on rule of law. This is something that we have learned uh, from uh, fighting uh, terrorists previously, and this is definitely something that we can employ um, fighting our new foes as well. I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Now just to bring our discussion back to the, to the title of it, <laughs> Regulated and Unregulated Warfare, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you think the future warfare can be regulated because the technological development is very fast right now. We have new emerging and disruptive technologies and is there at all possibility to regulate it or we will always be chasing something that is moving too fast? A question to everyone, whoever wants to speak. Hans, perhaps you? Mm -hmm. War is always unregulated. I don't know how you regulate war. Um, um, what we've seen here is a, um, an array of warfare. I'm actually surprised when we talked about cyber. One of the things I have not seen is a major cyber element to the war in Ukraine. Uh, maybe I'm missing it. <clears throat> maybe it's happening underneath the horizon, but uh, I don't see that. Um, we... Um, we talk about five domains of warfare, air, sea, land, space, cyber. There's a six, and you were mentioning it, it's resilience. Uh, in fact, in some ways, that's been the most important. So I think as we think about it as an alliance, as a nation, that may be a six domain, which is extremely important. Uh, what we've seen in Ukraine uh, is that uh, in those domains, uh, the fighting has been primarily uh, on the land. Uh, space assets, especially commercial space assets, have been very important. Mm -hmm. um, vulnerable, but important. Um, uh, in the air, uh, fighter aircraft have not played a major role. It's been it's been drones, and um, and um, uh, cruise missiles and, and that kind of an attack intended to intimidate and affect the will of the Ukrainian people. It has failed miserably. Uh, in fact, it's done exactly the opposite. Um, <clears throat> naval warfare really hasn't been a p part of this. I mean, we've seen the grain blockades, but uh, harpoon missiles and, and other um, Ukrainian missiles have been able to push back uh, the Russian Navy. So. You know, th this war has not been fought equally in all of these domains. Uh, it, it's focused on, on land. Uh, space has been important, a bit in the air, very little naval. Uh, and this resilience piece has been critical. And again, I haven't seen the cyber war. Maybe it's there. <clears throat> so that doesn't necessarily answer the question directly, but war, you can't regulate war. It's very hard to do that. 
Uh, but we have seen that this war has been compartmentalized in those ways. We have, I mean, we're now fighting in the trenches. It looks like World War I uh, in, uh, in some places. Okay. Well, but, uh, if, if I may, uh, to me it seems that uh, limiting uh, all the action to only uh, like Ukraine uh, it's a missing uh, big, bigger part of the picture, right? So uh, when we see the information operations that Russia conducts in the West, and we've seen several of those related to trying to stop Western arms deliveries to Ukraine. Also, we see them uh, trying to stop Ukrainian food expert, uh, experts and uh, uh, instigate the food crisis in the world uh, this way, also instigating the migration crisis uh, in the Western countries and knowing of the previous experience that uh, previously the issues of migrants were very difficult for uh, European countries to deal with. And so, I mean, we do treat Russia as a regional power, but I think it's a regional power with a global ambition and it actually thinks globally and it also thinks uh, systemically rather than uh, strategically, right? So uh, they think in terms of uh, vulnerabilities, in terms of connections between things, and in terms of how can they lo start a certain reaction and to shape and influence uh, certain things and uh, uh, decisions in Western countries. And so that is also a significant part of this war. And I think uh, so far the world, and Ukraine specifically, the, have been uh, able to deal with those things pretty successfully, but uh, we should not relax because Russia is is not going to stop that, so. Yeah, that's fair. Yes, indeed, security is not regional, it is global, and I think this war shows it uh, very much so. Yes, please. Thank you very much, a good question, yeah, and I, I, I think really the, the main idea of the hybrid warfare is, is that you have to be able to operate mainly un, under the threshold of the, the conventional war, and I, I mean, mean that that's the beauty what, what the Russia has been trying to do. And, and uh, then, then when it comes to rule of law and re regulation, so we don't have regulation for, for hybrid warfare, we don't have regulation for cyber warfare. And it's very difficult to say what is, uh, what is uh, hybrid influencing, what is hybrid war, and, and, and when, when it really starts the war. And, and also in the cyberspace, what is a criminal act and, and what, 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 it, what is a state act? Because the investigation takes normally to, uh, one or two years to get, uh, get out, out who, who is, uh, to figure out who is really behind this. So I mean, this is, this is, this is the blurry thing. And, and uh, when, when I'm, I'm looking at the Ukrainian conflict, if it, to make this more concrete, so, so what, what happened after, after Crimean operation? So, so I would say that... that Ukraine was heavily bombarded with cyber operations, so, so the Russians tried to, tried to destroy the critical infra in Ukraine with, with, with cyber attacks. But when they were not successful, they, they were not able to do it, then they had to start the military operations. So, so I, I mean, when I was um, 20 or 30 years ago, I was uh, studying mili military academy. We said that the war is always starting with, uh, with, with the air power. So with, with the bomb part, and then we are using the, the, the air, air defense component. Now we can say that this is the first time in, in, in the history of warfare that, that the war is starting with the cyber operation. And it, at the same time, it's, 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 it's the way how the Russians see that from hybrid warfare, you come to the, the, the it escalates to the, as they say, new generation warfare. But then the new generation for, for, for warfare, I agree, it, it's very old fashioned because they didn't really have the capacity to, to, to use the, the new, new asymmetric and cyber weapons. So because the best capacity is on the criminal side. And then if we are looking at the war in, in a little bit more broader perspective, and we also take the terrorism, which, which you pointed out, then we, then we see what are the consequences in the cyber world. The cyber criminals have been now divided into two, two blocks. There are those who are against Ukraine and, and for Russia, and there are those who, 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 who are supporting Ukraine. And look, why, why did the, the military military, military uh, uh, installation or, or Russian 
uh, military power. Why did it stop before the Kiev? One of the reasons were that, that the, the, the white the Belarusian uh, cyber partisans were able to go into the, the railway stations and, and to, do, to, to, to do the cyber attack and stop the trains. Where were the gasoline and ammunition? Together at the same time, the, the officers of course sold, the Russian officers sold the, the gasoline because they need money, money. So all this together, this was an asymmetric operation and it, it meant that, 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 that the offense was forced to stop before Kiev. So can we say that there is no contribution for the cyber side? I, I would disagree. I say that there, there have been quite strategic impacts and, and this long-standing impact, how, how the cyber crime has been now divided. It's, we will see in the future what, what, what will happen after the war, war is ended, ended and, and then of course how the capacities, how the cyber power is evolving in the cyberspace. So I would say it's, it's very, very difficult to see also in the future. That's why the intelligence is, is so important. It's very difficult to see, see what is a war and what is just an offense and what is just, just an influencing and, and, and so on. So, so situation awareness and strategic situation awareness comes to the picture. So every nation must have a good capacity to, to create the, the, the strategic situation awareness to be able to give the right advice to the policy, political decision makers is this serious? Is this just normal? What is happening all, all the time? Or, or when we come to the threshold and to be able to, to, to build the deterrence and prevention, you, have, you must, should be always ahead of your enemy. And this is the challenge in the future. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to be brief. So, um, we don't have regulations for hybrid warfare, mm -hmm. but we do have a lot of other laws. And actually, as we were fighting terrorists for already more than 20 years, quite intensely, we have a plenty of those laws. And the main laws that are applicable here as well, I would say, are the ones dealing with uh, financing. And there's, as the regular saying goes, that um, follow the money. Yeah? All the hybrid uh, activities, everything, everything needs money. And this is the essence. And this is why, where we still need a lot of effort to do, to clean up our own house, because we have been corrupted for a very long time by this illegal Russian money flowing into particularly Europe in big quantities. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I would like to know if there are questions from the audience, so we can move to the questions from the audience. Any questions from the audience? Yes, so please introduce yourself and tell us to whom your question is addressed. Yes, please. I will try to wrap it up. Thank you. Uh, Bucharest language, uh, change of uh, or change of this language. One of the goal of the Vilnius summit. You spoke about uh, expectations, or they say the sentiment towards uh, Europe and and EU. And I see um, what could be, let's say, a challenge uh, that these expectations could be disappointed in a certain way. And my question would be: uh, Can you uh, assess or enlighten us, maybe, on which level? and let's say in a bit negative way on which fatigue level we are inside Ukraine or in a positive way on which expectation level we are towards uh, a membership uh, inside, especially NATO uh, in Ukraine at the moment. Thank you. 
uh, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, well, I think that this support for uh, NATO membership, so support for membership is not the same as expectation that uh, Ukraine is uh, going to be admitted immediately, right? So we are, I think we are pretty clear-eyed about oh, what, what's happening and all the uh, discussions that are taking place in the alliance and we understand that it's not so that that's something that we really want but we don't understand that we understand that we're not going to get it immediately and so I don't think uh, uh, that there is going to be a frustration that you're talking about that there's going to be a disappointment uh, but and I think the government, at least uh, Ukrainian government, is pretty open uh, in uh, kind of talking, talking to the society and uh, telling uh, so what's happening. But also, it's very active in uh, uh, communicating and discussing these issues uh, in the alliance. So hopefully, we're going to move on this issue. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so, uh, what might we do with regard to the Bucharest language? Is there a next step that we can take here in Vilnius this summer on that? I think there is. Um, I, would, I would think you could have language as follows, um, that at Bucharest, the alliance uh, decided that both Ukraine and Georgia will become members, time undecided, that now uh, that time is coming. So you shorten the timelines. Uh, you can say, and I think this is right, that uh, Ukraine has met almost all of the criteria uh, laid out in the 1995 uh, enlargement documents uh, and that are required under the MAP program that when the fighting ends, uh, the alliance will move quickly uh, to uh, put Ukraine's membership application on a fast track. So I think you can create words like that. that and You have to do this with unity. What you don't want to do is what happened at Bucharest. We divided the alliance there. You don't want to do that again, so you have to wire this thing carefully before the summit. But I do think you could create language uh, that would move the ball forward. Yes, thank you. Uh, indeed, the uh, Secretary General of NATO has said uh, numerous times that the priority is, of course, to, for the war to end, uh, and then we can look into the next steps. And uh, any more questions from the audience? No. Okay, then, uh, yes, please. The microphone is in your desk because it's for the interpreters. It's important that you use the microphone. That's like in our parliament. So I go down. And my name is Roderich Kiesewetter from the German parliament. Uh, we have talked a lot about uh, military preparations, hybrid warfare. We have also spoken about societal cohesion. And I'm, I would like to express my gratitude to the to the uh, panel. I see a challenge regarding the attrition of societal cohesion as the longer the war lasts. So in Germany, for example, the country has invested 300 billion euros for societal cohesion and has not explained that we only invest three and a half billion euros for Ukraine armament support and so on. So people believe we do much more for Ukraine than for ourselves. So it's a question of public diplomacy, strategic diplomacy, regarding the information of the own population. And I see it similar in France. I know that it is not the same in the Baltic states or in Poland, because there is much more personal conviction and much more personal interest in, 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 uh, in the survivability of Ukraine. So I see a need to better explain to the Western societies the far west they are from the war. So I believe that the European Union and NATO should invest more in public diplomacy towards their own societies, um, also to 
get rid a little bit of this attritional attitude from Russia. Uh, they would like to prolong the war. The Chinese connection with Russia is also helping to prolong the war. And I believe that Putin is, is on the way to, to be convinced the longer the war lasts, the more refugees are absorbed in our societies, the willingness and uh, cohesiveness will shrink. So we need, I believe, a counter-narrative to our own population, but also to Russia and to Ukraine, that we stand aligned. And perhaps from the Ukrainian side, but also from the from, uh, United States or Finland, what could we do to improve the societal cohesion to avoid this attrition? I see this is a very tricky instrument because it's not... It's, it's like a vaccination. If you are not vaccinated and you don't get the virus, you don't remark it. But if you are not vaccinated you, and you get the virus, you will die. And I believe we are on the way which uh, Russia might bring into a position where the societal cohesion will shrink, whereas their military progress is, is not very helpful for them. But uh, the, 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 the fifth colon in our own societies might disturb or even destroy uh, the willingness of victory. So do you have a recipe or, or additional ideas in this? Well, thank you for highlighting the importance of public diplomacy. Uh, I represent NATO Public Diplomacy Division, so I definitely support uh, this view. So the question is, what could we do uh, to ensure societal cohesion? Who would like to, to comment? Hans? All right, thank you for putting your finger on a very important point uh, in when I commented earlier about what should we do with regard to Ukraine, uh, that was my first point. I, th I made it quickly, but that's essentially what I was thinking about. What can you say to make it clear to Moscow that uh, that strategy is not going to work? Now, in the United States, we see some of this. We see some of this attrition already. Um, the public opinion uh, polls uh, six months ago were showing more than 60 percent support for that current level of a provision of weapons to Ukraine. That number has now dropped below 50 percent. So we're already seeing some of this in the United States. Um, and uh, we have had a, a major Republican uh, personage um, just say in the last couple of weeks uh, this is a territorial war, implying that it doesn't have international implications. He's backed off of that. He's backed off of that. So that's important. Uh, but it does indicate that there is this element in the Republican Party uh, that uh, needs to be convinced. Uh, interestingly, you have uh, two elements in the Republican Party. One says Biden is not doing enough. The other says he's doing too much. So, uh, But I, I do think that there are arguments that can be used. Uh, and one of them is that the consequences of what happens in Ukraine uh, will have broader implications. I don't think, actually, that uh, those are primarily for NATO. I don't, I think we talked earlier about deterrence. I think NATO deters. Uh, the problem with Ukraine was that it wasn't in NATO and it was relying on lesser assurances, partnerships, economic sanctions. It didn't have uh, the right array of things to deter. Um, that, so the argument would be that China's watching um, and uh, that if Putin is allowed to win this thing, especially now that he's been labeled a war criminal, uh, that if he can get away with this, uh, there are broader global consequences. And I think you can play with that notion and come up with a strategy that uh, uh, would provide a bit more support for what we're doing. Uh, I think it's also important how you frame the issue because uh, from, from the very beginning when the uh, war started in 2014, I think Russia to a large extent succeeded in portraying it as a sort of a crisis in Ukraine and it's, it being a civil war in Ukraine. And so uh, if you read Western media and if you listen to even some high level Western uh, 
experts, very often you still hear that this is a civil war, you know, but uh, to, to us inside of the country, it's absolutely clear that from the very beginning, uh, this whole thing was a result of Russian interference, but the, at that time, Ukrainian government was not strong enough to be able to, you know, fight back because it was immediately after uh, the events known as the Euromaidan revolution, right? And so a, a power transition, and so there was now the, the government was not uh, working properly to uh, counter the Russian uh, aggression at that time. So, but the point is uh, how you frame the issue. And so, if it's just uh, you know a, a minor problem in Ukraine, then it's one story. But then, if it's uh, actually uh, a Russian uh, quest to uh, re-establish its influence in uh, in Europe and re-establish its presence and being able to dictate the rules, uh, then it's a different story. And also, if you look at the policies that Russia pursues at the occupied territories of Ukraine, what they do is uh, they uh, mobilize residents of those territories and force them to go to war against Ukraine. And so I'm absolutely confident that if they uh, grab... Uh, a bigger portion of Ukraine, what they're going to do is do the same thing, is mobilize Ukrainians and force them to go to war against Europeans. And I don't think this is what you want to, you, you want to happen. And so I think that uh, that could be one of the reasons and one of the things uh, to explain to uh, to the people that actually uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine is not just some local conflict that's going to have implications for Europe as well. Thanks. Yeah, if I may add just, uh, this is a very crucial and important question, and, and uh, we see it every day. And, and I think three things we have to do. First thing is that, that, that we, we have to figure out in every country how the Russians are all the time supporting the extreme movements, like in Germany, in Finland, they, they try to create uh, an, an, uh, narratives to, to the media and especially utilizing the social media. So, so we have to be better in, 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 in figuring this out and fighting against the, the disinformation here. The second, um, second thing is, of, of, of course, how you work together with, with the media, with the national, national media, wha, wha, that they are keeping these uh, facts uh, on, on board. And, and uh, actually in Finland it's good that uh, the biggest, the biggest uh, broadcasting companies, they, they have their reporters, we are, we are getting every day information uh, what, what is happening in Ukraine. So this is anyway in Finland because we have had wars in the past, so, so this is having a great impact to the minds and hearts of the people. They, they understand that, that, that we, we have to do more, more on this. So the cooperation with media also at national level, it, it's crucial. And the third thing is, is and, and perhaps uh, he, we, here was a little bit referred, so, so we, we must have a stronger global narrative, because the Russians, they have a very clear and simple nar narrative which they are using. So we have to be more united and, and, and we be more precise in, in our, our global na narratives that, that Russia is the terrorist state and what, what they are do, doing in practice and, and so on. So, so this, this is because then, then it, it goes through to the, to the citizens' level, which is important. Otherwise, the citizens are, are like we have election next week in Finland. They are more interested in national things and economic things and so on. So we have to keep this on track. Yes, indeed. Uh, looking at the public opinion is very important related to this. And in fact, NATO just published the pre-summit uh, polling results. And what we saw is that the uh, number of respondents who view Russia unfavorably increased by more than 20%. And also, uh, in fact, 67% of respondents in NATO countries perceived that the invasion actually affected their own safety and security. So we cannot say that, well, the war is forgotten in the West, in NATO countries, because it, it is not. And at the same time, support uh, to NATO remains uh, high. So with that, I think uh, we are right on time. <laughs> and now it's time for a coffee break, according to our program. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much. What pleasure. Was, uh...
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We will continue with the uh, second panel discussion. Uh. Okay, I will, I will start there. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we will proceed with our second panel. Uh, the topic of this panel uh, will be how effective is today's deterrent strategy. And moderator of this panel is uh, Ms. Molly McHugh. Uh, she is an uh, information warfare expert, foreign policy and strategy consultant from the United States. So, Molly, uh, floor is yours. Great. Uh, let's get our other panelists up here. Alexi, come on up. And we're missing uh, Roderich. Yes, wherever you would like. Okay. okay. There he is. <laughs> One moment, please. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start while everybody situates themselves. So uh, every day, uh, Ukrainians are doing impossible things to defend their nation, physically, psychologically, spiritually, from Russian attack. Men and women who 14 months ago were athletes or journalists and cameramen, teachers, tech workers, writers, artists, elected officials in some cases, a thousand normal things have transformed those skills into tools of survival for their country. They've joined the men and women who, in the prior eight years, rebuilt uh, the Ukrainian armed forces in a time of war. Uh, and they've created an atmosphere of relentlessness, of ingenuity, of insurgency, of humanity that uniquely defines the new fighting style of the armed forces of Ukraine and the civilians that amplify everything that they do. And all of this has brought fear to Russian forces in Ukraine. And it stopped Russia from achieving its ambitions in Ukraine. But it has not deterred them from engaging in this meat grinder that they consistently throw themselves at. And I don't think that we give our Ukrainian colleagues enough credit for what they have had to do and for what we ask them to do every day. We don't give them uh, the weapons that they need so that they don't have to close this capabilities gap with bodies. Um, and I think that uh, when we look at what we have asked Ukrainians to do, what we have asked Ukraine to do, it begs the question, do we believe that our nations would be prepared to do the same? Um, do we acknowledge, for example, that we ask more of the Baltic nations than any of the other allies in terms of having to prepare to face the same type of crisis potentially uh, if the war were to come to them than any of the other allies within NATO? Do we understand that deterrence by denial, what, what, what that actually requires here and in the rest of the alliance, 
And do we understand where the borders and boundaries of deterrence actually are? And our Finnish colleague in the previous panel mentioned um, that we are focused, uh, so much focused now on being glad that the Russians have not invaded NATO, uh, that we're not very focused on all of the tools of hybrid war that are still being leveraged against us uh, during the war, the physical war against Ukraine. So every day we ask Ukrainians to do impossible things, and I think we have to not become numb to that reality. And I think we, thus, we must therefore be prepared uh, uh, to do the same of ourselves, to ensure that this blood sacrifice gives us the greatest possible chance that we're ever gonna have at rebalancing our security and getting right what we've gotten wrong about Russia for the last 30 years. So this panel uh, in our conference about uh, unified deterrence uh, is supposed to be about how effective, uh, how effective is today's deterrent strategy. And I think given where we are in the war and the challenges that we face as an alliance heading into the Vilnius summit in July, I think we owe it to ourselves to sharpen our discussion as much as possible and to actually ask, is there deterrence without Ukrainian victory? Uh, so we're just gonna confront this openly today, I think. <laughs> are we focused enough on the future of deterrence when we say things like, until the end, on Ukraine? Um, to describe our strategy uh, on Ukraine right now. And what does that mean? What does it mean to our adversaries, our allies, and to everyone in between? So, to address these questions, we have this distinguished panel. I will give very brief introductions because I don't believe anybody here doesn't know who we are speaking to. Uh, but Ben Hodges, retired Lieutenant General, former Commander of U.S. Army Europe, now Senior Advisor to Human Rights First. Uh, Bertrand Sun, who is Deputy Assistant um, uh, General of the Operations Division at NATO HQ. Uh, Roderich Kisevetter, who is a member of the Bundestag, and Alexei Arstovich, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, former advisor to the Ukrainian president, and of course, infamous podcaster. So, um, I think we'll start by asking each of our panelists uh, a short question, which is, if we're thinking about effectiveness of deterrence, which we're supposed to be discussing in this panel, um, beginning with the lead up to the full-scale invasion in February 2022, so in the period beforehand uh, as well, until now, uh, what is the one greatest strength that either uh, your nation or alliance, so speaking of the US, Germany, Ukraine, NATO, has displayed, and what's the one greatest missed opportunity that you think that we've seen so far? And maybe we'll start with, uh, with Alexei on this one and go, go down to Ben. Thank you for the ability to speak in about missed opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> but for us, it's, uh, you see this, uh, all main achievements that the Russians uh, has uh, had uh, in this war, it's uh, of our problems. It's a problem about the speed of reaction. So we can speak in about speed of decision making. Um, uh, for example, the invasion started to 24th and first Rammstein we have is at 26th in April, two months late. And it was uh, two months of very, very heavy fighting. And uh, in the end of the march, we ins insufficient our missile, uh, rocket missiles. It was almost empty. Russians have still surrounded Kyiv, and we can't to strike them on the long range because we for, have not any ability for this, because we have no, any shells. Nobody was properly prepare it for full-scale con conflict, which is the largest, uh, second and the largest uh, after the World War II in Europe. Second one <coughs> is the speed of uh, reaction of um, defend industries. Russian spends one and a half and two millions shells per month every first 11 months probably of this war, just right now, two months uh, uh, later, they start to have some problems with shells. Before it was uh, 60,000 shells per day on our positions. We can answer just only four or 5,000 uh, of shells because of uh, Soviet uh, shells uh, was used very quickly. And NATO, 155 shells. NATO, all NATO products only 300,000 uh, shells per year, and Russians spend 2 million in, in, in months. It's completely asymmetric things, and our infantrymen face to sit in monthly uh, under 15 hour shell shelling on our positions. It's a lot of blo blood of our infantry, and we stay in just for for our, I don't know, for our will. And because uh, 
it's uh, even difficult to explain what what feeling uh, Ukrainian infantrymen when it's sitting on, under the the rain of the shells monthly monthly and, and another one is this, this, uh, speed of produce this military equipment we know even now when the European Union decide, decide, make a decisions to provide us one million shells per year it's still not enough for our needs, real needs. Not for our wishes, just for really needs. And they were, it's a still, a still a problem. Yeah. So too slow to make decisions, too slow to close the gap, to, too to, slow to get you ammo. Too slow. The speed How about a strength? Speed, What's one thing that's been done well, you think? Uh, the most, most uh, important things, I think, it's uh, the NATO face for Russians, China and uh, Iran, they will to make Ukraine win and will the collective West win. Yep. Because Russians uh, make a decision just looking for the psychological sphere, first of all. Russian policy, Russian the method, methods of the hybrid and war, uh, to provide hybrid warfare is striking their mind and hearts. And they they very, very carefully looking for what we have here and here. You do we have the will to fight? And when the West demonstrates with this will, Russians start to to short their plans. Yeah. Because uh, we can all can remember how how much and how long they're speaking about nuclear nuclear using nuclear weapons. Now just Mr. Medvedev, which is uh, <clears throat> a very strange person. <laughs> Give him ability to speak in, in, on this topic. No, nobody says about it. Nothing yeah. about nuclear weapon. And uh, it's, it's, it's a result of the demonstrate the strong will, strictly will of the West, Good. for win this and to fight with this, to face this. Roderick, would you agree with that, or would you have other strengths and weaknesses to highlight? <laughs> Well, I, I could align myself with that. Thank you for the invitation. But I see the strongest catalyst also for the change of mood inside the Western societies is the resilience of the Ukrainian population, is the willingness to win, the willingness to fight and to withstand. And as a German, I must say that a vast majority of the ruling government was in the belief that Ukraine will not withstand. And the main core of the Zeitenwende speech was the fear that Russia may stand at the Polish border within four or five weeks. Therefore, this Zeitenwende speech. And when Germany became aware that Ukraine is much more brave than some of the pacifist politicians thought, um, the speed for Zeitenwende was slowed down tremendously. So I would like to combine the catalyst of the Ukrainian resilience, the willingness to win, the, I would like to say, the, the, the will for freedom and to defend the European freedom coincides negatively with uh, the, the, I would like to say, the, the biggest weakness of, of the whole operation. That's the time factor. So we need to speed up, especially from the stronger economies in, in Western Europe and Southern Europe. We need to speed up and to deliver more. We cannot afford that only the Ukrainian people is fighting for our freedom. And therefore, the time factor is key to, to improve, to speed up, uh, not only with the armaments production, but also with the willingness to deliver, with the willingness to train, to exercise, and also to convince, we had it in the first panel, to convince the population that we must redefine welfare and security. Security first, and welfare is combined with security. Welfare has no worth at all if it is combined with loss of freedom, with loss of influence, with loss of attractivity of our Western society and the Western alliance. So, yes, I, I could align, but uh, I see we need a change of mood in Germany and France, so I do not want to talk about the Middle Eastern European countries. They have understood since two decades or three decades what's at stake. And we have to overcome, especially in Germany, also in France a little bit, the romanticism towards Russia. Russia is not our most important neighbor, as some uh, people define. 
it is a neighbor and it is of much more importance that Ukraine becomes part of the European Union and NATO. And therefore, we have also to take into account that the Ukrainian people is fighting for our welfare and sacrificing their infrastructure, sacrificing their families, sacrificing their societal cohesion as well. So I'm very strongly believing that we must do more and that our weakness is the attrition and the romantic hope to cope with the Russia post-war. What we need is to learn that we are target of the war, that we have to avoid, secondly, to become a war party. This will be the case if the war goes to Moldova or even further, because in Moldova there live uh, citizens uh, of Romania, which is part of NATO and European Union. So Romania has a choice and we need to avoid this choice. And third, we need uh, to redefine our security with Ukraine and therefore, Russia must learn to lose. What does this mean? To give up all the imperial aspects, all the imperial deliberations, the colonial um, willingness, as well as their very racist war inside their own society, because uh, the Russian minorities, the ethnic mi minorities of the Russian Federation are bleeding. And the Russian officers, they uh, have a a horrible war, but they are sacrificing the minorities and they are also sacrificing uh, um, prisoners of, of certain uh, uh, camps and of, of certain prisons, which is horrible also for the Russian society after the war. This is a completely um, um, a, a rotten society, so we have to be aware that if Russia learns to lose, and Ukraine must win, that we have to take care that, that the virus inside Russia has no chance to come back. This imperial deliberations and this um, very, I would like to say, nearly fascist behavior regarding to the neighborhood and to the own minorities. Yeah. So there can't be a way back with Russia, but there has to be a way ahead with Ukraine. I think we, we all agree with that in this room. Uh, but you. Thank you, Molly. Um, so I would say uh, the Western unity has been uh, a great uh, success story so far. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, we have, I think, uh, answered uh, Putin in a very uh, direct and uh, clear way. He uh, claimed to want less NATO, and we have given him, in fact, more NATO with uh, more members, uh, with more troops, uh, with more deployments in the eastern flank, uh, with readier uh, forces. Um, and with uh, better aligned uh, plans, uh, with national plans. So uh, clearly it, his strategy has failed and we have to make sure that this continues. Uh, so um, he has made a lot, of, uh, a lot of wrong assumptions about the Ukrainian willingness uh, and ability to fight back, uh, about his own uh, operational uh, success, uh, about our unity. Uh, and uh, going ahead, uh, we need to make sure that uh, this, uh, this remains, uh, his, his uh, assumptions continue to crumble. Uh, it, uh, the uh, war uh, comes at a great cost, human cost, to Russia itself as well, uh, as, uh, as was just uh, said. Um, and uh, we need to outlast uh, this, uh, his willingness uh, to uh, continue to fight. And I think going ahead, uh, keeping our unity uh, is absolutely key. Of course, uh, speed of decision making uh, is also key. Uh, I agree with that. Um, and uh, we have uh, taken a number of measures, and especially with the, uh, working more with the defense industry and um, uh, in increasing the capability of uh, uh, production uh, is going to be very important. Not only because we, of course, need to continue to um, uh, give uh, Ukraine the weapons, uh, uh, ammunition also uh, that it needs, but also we have to replenish our own stockpiles because we, have, we are running very low uh, because, because of this war. Thank you. Ben, to you. So obviously the, the principal strength that has been on display in addition to the will of Ukrainian people and, and soldiers and their adapt how quickly they can learn and integrate new technologies 
is the speed with which the United States, NATO, all of us responded. I mean, that's it's incredible. Thank goodness we still had infrastructure in Europe, particularly in Germany, that allowed us to bring stuff together. Uh, those relationships, you know, you, you can't just do this as a, as a pickup game. But we should have never had to do this. This is what failed deterrence, what's happening now is what failed deterrence looks like. Uh, Russia clearly 100% the aggressor here. There's no, there's no question of like, well, you know, whose fault is this? It's 100%. Everybody recognizes Russia's fault. They are the aggressor. But they made some strategic, terrible strategic miscalculations. Uh, they assumed that they had huge force advantage, that they would be able to roll over Ukrainian forces and that this would be like Prague or Budapest back during the, during the Cold War. That's, that was the, their first strategic miscalculation. The second one, though, they were sure that they could isolate Ukraine, that the West would not actually do anything because we, didn't, we did not do anything. And this goes back in the U.S. Republican and Democratic administrations. We did not do anything after they invaded Georgia. We did not do anything, not really, after they invaded Ukraine in 2014. And we did not do anything after their, the Assad regime with Russian support used chemical weapons against their own people. So three different times where we had opportunities to stop them, we didn't do it. So you could almost imagine the conversation of the Kremlin saying, like, the Americans are a mess. Um, they've, uh, with all their own internal domestic problems and coming out of Afghanistan, the UK is a mess, you know, with their previous prime minister, previous, previous prime minister, uh, and Germany is still building Nord Stream 2. They're not going to do anything. So that was the other miscalculation was that they would be able to isolate Ukraine and that they would probably be able to break NATO on top of destroying Ukraine. So this is what failed deterrence looks like. But I would also say, and I, I think I'm pretty clear uh, there, uh, on my support for Ukraine and how impressed I am with them and that I, I will do anything in the world to help them win, but Ukraine wasted eight years. Where was all the ammunition production that should have been happening after 2014? Instead of crying every day like the West is cowards, the West is not helping us enough. I mean, let's be honest, you wasted eight years of production. I visited the famous uh, tank plant in Kharkiv, because uh, I'm a history nerd, and I wanted to see this famous tank plant back in uh, 2017. This was a place where the T-34 was born. I mean, like the most famous tank in history. So I went there, and it was impressive, I mean, old style industry, but nonetheless, it was impressive. And there were people working on repairing tanks. And, and then I noticed over here a row of brand new tanks. I mean, they still had the new car smell. And I asked the, uh, the manager, I said, are these going to the ATO? Which is what they used to call the Donbass, the anti-terrorist operations zone. Are these going to ATO? He goes, no, 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 those are export to Thailand. I said, what? You are humping our leg for javelin and you're exporting top quality tanks to Thailand? So failed deterrence is not just the fault of the West. The Russians were sure that they would roll over Ukraine because Ukraine was also not prepared. Deciding to create the TDF after Russia invades is not exactly uh, showing that you're prepared. And I worry that the same thing is still happening here in some inside Europe. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to use my purview as moderator to ask you a quick follow-up then, Ben. Uh, we've talked about this over the years uh, many times uh, at this conference and in other forum, forums, but um, so if we're talking about deterrence and defense preparations in the context of Ukraine um, and looking at the Baltics, which is what we've talked about and, and argued back and forth about the most, um, are we doing enough here now to really instill deterrence in the way that we need to um, and specifically looking at Lithuania, do you think there's been enough uh, focus on defense preparations um, since 2014, but also since uh, the most recent phase of the war in Ukraine? So Lithuania, of course, has been a two percenter um, almost from the beginning. Uh, and certainly um, they, are, they are a leader inside the alliance now on investment. But having a big giant sign on your border that says we spent two percent, is not going to do anything, all right? So it's not about 2%. It's about, is Lithuania ready to defend itself? I would say no. 
And you could have a German division here. That's, that's, not, that's not the point. The point is, what are you doing, Lithuania, in accordance with Article 3 of the Washington Treaty? Everybody knows Article 5, right? You know, an armed attack on one shall be considered an attack on all. Article 3 says, you are responsible for your own defense and being ready to help others. I would ask, and I'm sorry that the members of the parliament are not still here, um, I would ask them, uh, how, how are we doing on cooperation with Poland? I would say not so well. Um, because, you know, Poland, your big strong neighbor to the south, and the Suwalki Corridor, I mean, this, this is all about Poland. This is not going to be about the Rifleman uh, Union. This is going to be working, in, being integrated with Poland and having the German battle group uh, and the American battalion integrated into the defense. I think this is an area that the uh, defense committee should be asking about. Societal resilience. I've been in Lithuania, I don't know how many times over the last 10 years. I love coming here. I never get the feeling that there is a sense of urgency to create societal resilience like what you see in Finland. I, I don't feel it. I would be willing to bet probably not 5% of the people in Finland or in uh, Lithuania have taken the preparations of their home just in case, other than if it's real damn cold. Other than that, I mean, what preparations have been made? Um, I think that Lithuania probably has about 120,000 soldiers that are reservists, that are on a list somewhere. Almost none of them have been called, trained, or anything is they're on a list but they have it that part of your defense has not been exercised let's let's cut the number in half let's say my number's wrong 50 percent of 120,000 is 60,000 that's 12 brigades you're, you're wanting Germany to come here with a brigade and you've got the manpower for 12 brigades okay so I think this is something that the pilot that the political leaders need to look at um, military mobility, the, the need to be able to move as fast or faster than Russian Federation forces. How long have we been working on Rail Baltica? That's still not finished. That's incredible. I mean, that's, that's, that's what will bring tanks into the Baltic countries and, and heavy equipment and ammunition. And you still have, we still haven't finished this railroad. We heard three very, very good speeches this morning at the start. I mean, all of them are good. Not one of the three said anything about, and this is what we're doing in Lithuania, other than 2%. I didn't hear anybody um, talk about, this is what we have to do, Lithuania, to make sure. And then finally, something that I have never understood, well, that's not true, I do understand it, but it continues to frustrate me. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania have almost no equipment in common. I mean, you can't use each other's ammunition. How can three countries the size of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, how do you, you can't afford to have three separate sets of armored vehicles or howitzers. You, you can't afford it. So before, and I'm not against a German brigade coming here. The Germans, when they show up, you can be sure they will be good. But before you, um, spend so much energy talking about where's this German brigade you promise. I just gave you six ideas that you should be working on here while you're waiting on the Bundeswehr to get here. I think America could also embrace the... <laughs> America can also embrace the need to fix our rail transport issues as well. Um, so, moving on to our next question for the panel, um, what is the future of deterrence without Ukrainian victory? Uh, if we fail to support a clear Ukrainian victory, what are the consequences for us uh, as individual nations, as an alliance? And alternatively, what does it look like if we get that right? Um, let's do Roderick first on this one. First of all, the plea of General Ben Hodges to Lithuania could also be a plea to Germany. So, we all feel embraced by your speech, Ben. <laughs> um, we have also to do our homework. Uh, well, I, s I only want to mention some of the consequences if Ukraine was to fail what not will happen. But first of all, we will see that nuclear deterrence is working as self-containment. And therefore, 
I believe that after a failed war, we will have a nuclear arms race with those states who are not aligned with an alliance. So I see the danger of nuclear proliferation after this war, especially in the near Middle East, as one consequence. The second would be, uh, I believe the Ukrainian population who, who is mobile and agile will see no future in its country and will fulfill a second desire of Putin, that's mass migration, to split the societal cohesion in especially the Western European countries. So this is also a very important reason to support Ukraine, to give perspectives to the population, not only to stay, but to come back uh, with a lot of experience from the states who have uh, taken them inside their societies. Poland, more than three million. Germany, more than one million. And others also in very high numbers. Uh, already 8 million have left the country. 8 million are refugees, displaced persons inside Ukraine. So we need to give them a perspective. That's also a reason why Ukraine must win. The third is really, I see the danger in view of the American presidential elections, a partition or a split, a transatlantic split, because the Europeans have not understood the message of the United States, fair burden sharing. The United States are investing about, correct me, than about 10 times more in civilian and military means than all European countries together. This is not a fair burden sharing. So the message from the European should be, from the Europeans, from us should be, we have understood the US investment is the catalyst, but the Americans need their energy for the Indo-Pacific, as we do. So. We, we, we need a stronger European endeavor. The fourth is we will have a loss of trust, especially in the southern vicinity of Europe. If we cooperate with the MENA region, we request from them um, good governance, fight against organized crime, fight against corruption, uh, take care for minorities, respect human uh, uh, female rights. All this what Ukraine is working for. And these countries say, well, Ukraine wanted to achieve that. You leave them alone, they lose. Why should we cooperate with you? We will cooperate with the third, with the elephant in the room, with the third party, that's China. They don't raise questions, they invest in our infrastructure, and they do not fight against the corrupt elites. They finance them. So this would be really an evil in the decades to come. Further on, uh, the war will not stop if Ukraine might fail. The war will continue as promised in Moldova. Putin's aim is to become us as a, that we become a war party. So if Moldova becomes part of the Russian game, they are already starting uh, civil unrests there, then uh, the question is, will Romania choose Article 42 of the European Treaty or Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, because nearly a half of the inhabitants of Moldova have a Romanian passport. And sixth, this would all work for China, because this long-term attrition after Ukraine, what will not happen, might fail, they save time to include Taiwan because we are not able or have no power any longer for sanctions and uh, for, uh, to with withstand in a kind of AUKUS or a kind of Indo-Pacific alliance with rule-based states. And seventh, it will be a blueprint for Iran to gain nuclear weapons, not to have the fate of Ukraine so they will not accept the JCPOA any longer. And we can see then the stronger influence of Iran in Iraq. And we will have a one-sided reaction from Israel. So the likelihood of further conflicts will increase if Ukraine failed. And so there are seven reasons why Ukraine must win and Russia learn to lose. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Berchu. 
So in, in wars, of course, there are no uh, zero uh, risk uh, options, uh, but uh, it is uh, our understanding, our appreciation that the biggest risk is if uh, Putin is allowed to win. So uh, Ukraine uh, indeed uh, is vital for the stability of uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, region. Uh, we have been uh, very conscious of this since the beginning, uh, and our partnership with Ukraine goes back to the 1990s, uh, and, and we've always... Uh, given a lot of importance to our uh, strategic partnership with Ukraine. Um, and so uh, this is an, uh, not new as strategy to uh, uh, preserve uh, or help preserve uh, Ukraine as a democratic, uh, secure and prosperous country uh, in, in Europe. And that is a long-standing uh, strategy. So um, we will uh, definitely um, uh, make sure uh, that uh, we help Ukraine in its uh, hour of need. We continue to do that. Uh, while doing so, uh, NATO as such is not becoming a, a party to the war. Why? Because we need to shield our allies uh, from, this, uh, from this war. That, that is our number one uh, responsibility. And we have done that uh, through enhanced vigilance activities before, uh, before the war. And as the war started, we have uh, activated each of our response uh, plans. Uh, and uh, this has allowed us, uh, all the allies, to uh, rapidly reinforce uh, the eastern flank. We've deployed, you, you, you said, Molly, not to mention numbers, so I won't, but tens of thousands of troops uh, uh, in the land. Uh, also, uh, we have a, a very much enhanced uh, air and maritime presence, cyber and space operations. So uh, really, uh, a lot of effort uh, has gone and is still going on into shielding all the allies. Uh, and this is not, in fact, uh, irrelevant to our uh, effort to Ukraine either, because by doing so, we are protecting the hubs from which, from which um, Ukraine receives uh, assistance, uh, all, of, uh, all of which are in uh, alliance territory uh, and, in fact, uh, covered by Article 5. Um, so uh, we are continuing with all these efforts. We are doing a transformation uh, of uh, the most significant transformation uh, since uh, the end of the Cold War. Um, it's not easy to bring um, mindsets uh, and uh, mechanisms from uh, fighting um, uh, non-Article 5 uh, out-of-area operations to territorial defense, uh, but we are really on the firm uh, uh, path uh, to, to doing so. And this, we are now updating uh, plans, updating command and control. Uh, the for, new uh, force model was mentioned uh, and the force structure requirements and also integrated air and defense, uh, air and missile defense. So on all uh, aspects, uh, we are moving ahead. Um, uh, we are strengthening the alliance um, and we are continuing uh, uh, and strengthening our support to Ukraine. We have, um, uh, again, no mention of numbers, but uh, obviously uh, very much uh, um, uh, supported uh, Ukraine, both uh, in humanitarian um, and um, uh, economic and military terms. So both uh, NATO allies and European Union uh, member states have uh, uh, poured a lot of uh, resources into this. And we, m we have to make sure that this is a long-lasting uh, effort, of course, going ahead. Thank you. Great. All of this needs to be for something is, uh, I think, a sentiment many of us feel every day. Uh, ben. Well, of course, one of the uh, outcomes if Ukraine is defeated, if Russia, if Russia is successful, is that we'll be back here in two years at Vydotis' conference talking about you know, the next phase of the Russian uh, invasion because they'll have launched again from Crimea uh, and uh, Millions of people will not have received the grain that they were counting on and, and all the other things that Roderick alluded to, I would agree with that. So we'll, we'll be in here wringing our hands like, oh my God, how did this happen? And we'll be doing a big gigantic AAR after action review on why didn't we ever have a clear strategic outcome, a strategic objective from the American president or from all the other Western leaders. You know, we, we never said we want Ukraine to win and therefore we didn't do things as fast as we should have done to help make sure they were going to win. That, that'll be one of the outcomes sitting in here feeling bad about how bad things went. So I think you have to ask, first of all, why do we care about Ukraine? I mean, other than I love the people and the history and, I mean, it's so impressive, but that's not, that's not strategy. I mean, that's not a reason to invest zillions of dollars in euros. So if we understand why we care about it, then you can clearly understand what's the price we're going to pay if it fails. America's economic prosperity is tied directly to Europe's 
economic prosperity. I mean, directly. And Europe's economic prosperity depends on security and stability in Europe, uninterrupted energy flow, uh, not having millions of refugees, uh, food supply, infrastructure, all those things. America depends on that. At the Munich Security Conference last month in February, Senator McConnell led a large Republican delegation as part of the largest ever congressional delegation to attend the Munich Security Conference. And he said, I am here along with a lot of Republican leadership to demonstrate that we, the Republicans, also care about Ukraine and NATO and Europe, that it is about our core interests. I thought that was very powerful that he felt the need to distance himself from the handful of loudmouth crazies um, that no, this is important for America's strategic interests. So that's, that's number one. Number two, why do we care? We say we care about the international rules-based order. Now, what, what does that mean? Let's unpack that for just a second. It means respect for, and these are things that matter to every American. Respect for sovereignty, which means respect for borders, right? That's what's at stake here. Freedom of navigation, which is important for every American business that exports. So protecting freedom of navigation. Respect for international airspace. We saw Russia already challenge that two weeks ago when they went up and knocked down one of our, one of our drones. This is about use of international airspace. Now they say, well, this is ours because it's Crimea. So if that's allowed to stand, then we have de facto acknowledged their illegal claim of Crimea. So this, this is what's at, at, at stake here. Um, international law. All of American businesses depend on transparency on international law for all of our businesses. That's what's at stake here. And then, of course, human rights. I don't want to hear people talk about values. Uh, and we don't do a thing to hold Russia accountable for the death of tens of thousands of civilians. The third reason that it matters, of course, is China. I hear it all the time from uh, uh, my Republican friends like, come on, China is the real problem here. Okay, well, you can be sure that the Chinese are watching very closely exactly what we do. If we're not willing, if the West cannot stick together and help Ukraine defeat an obviously very weak Russia, then I think the Chinese will not be very impressed with anything that we say about Taiwan or South China Sea or, or, or anywhere else. And they're going to see that we are deterring ourselves just because some knucklehead like Medvedev says, oh, we're going to use nukes. And they remind us every week that they have nuclear weapons. And so the United States, we continue to deter ourselves because they might use a tactical nuclear weapon. Who else is listening to that? North Korea? Iran, Pakistan, Israel, everybody else that has a nuclear weapon as well, that the United States can be deterred from acting because we worried that they might use a tactical nuclear weapon, which they're not, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, agree with that. And I think none of us want to be back here in two years talking about how we failed to do X, Y, Z. And thus, I leave it to you uh, for the final points on this. Unfairly and fairly, you get, to, you get the final points on Thank you so what much, happens if we fail to support Ukrainian victory. Uh, if, the West, if we lose, lose this war, but we don't. We will, we, will, we will not. We will fight by our tools. If we, we, we will not, not have Western weapon, we fight by, by arms, by, by stones, and fight for last Russian soldier will be killed and throw out from the Ukraine territory. But still, if the, we lose, <clears throat> it will be a great black hole instead of the trust to the collective West in the world. Nobody in the Asia-Pacific region in any place in the world, still believe in, in the West uh, assistance, West help, in democracy and something like this. Because anybody understand, after American coalition leave in Afghanistan, after losing the war in Ukraine, it's no, bo no more hope on the West. Well, West assistance and West ability to secure democracy, security, open, open society, security, right, human rights, and something like this. Uh, second one, 
Russia and Ukraine has more than 1,000 military and industry um, factories, which is a for formed part of Soviet uh, defense industry system. Russia collect, already collect a lot of our resources, including manpower on our occupied territory, and to send them in, uh, to fight with Ukrainians. If we lose this war, Russia, for five years, get and be more and more stronger than they already already has and uh, the west especially the baltic states poland uh, all, all, all neighbors countries will be face a more dangerous thing than they have right now when we still fight and um, all dictators so one all dictators in the world all future dictators and all dictators they don't really understand now they are di dictator ah they lift up their heads and st and understand the way which is russia provide their policy is working really work and uh, they start do the same things we can see into the africa we can uh, we can uh, uh, see mali central africa africa republic mozambique angola and something like this and all of this uh, head of states and the so called head of states start to ask in russia for military help in and start to provide uh, the um, policy of the violence uh, to, de to decide a lot of questions which we, we have in Africa and in other parts of the world. We know the Wagner Group is uh, properly working with Africa states and uh, it's uh, provide a lot of problems for coalition forces in Suhail, for a French um, Republic, and it will be increased more and more and more. So. I'm finished and we face, the world face and collective West face so much problem if we, if we lost. That is, I can't even imagine we can, we lost this game. We have, we have win. Russia understand to just one reason. If the last Russian soldier will, will, will be thrown out from Ukraine territory. Because if we leave him 10 squad, squad meters, they still believe the West is weak and they have ability to fight and achieve their goals. Just only complete, clear uh, retreat from our territory. Complete, re real uh, mm, losing the, the war on the ground. It's uh, make Russian understand and, and other dictators understand that it's not way to do these things in the smaller world in the 21st century. Yeah, I think uh, there's certainly signs that Russia's going to be watching the NATO summit this summer to see if it's us uh, weakening on where we are on Ukraine, looking for options, or us pushing forward. Uh, and reassuring that the support will be there as long as needed. Um, so I think that's a critical moment. And I would just highlight with what you said, and I think it's uh, what, what our whole panel has said, which is really powerful, this idea that it's really a pivot point for all the stuff we say we stand for in Ukraine. If we don't stand for it there, then really we've made the point that we don't stand for it. Um, that this week, uh, or maybe last week, I lose track of the blur of time these days, but, um, uh, there was sort of a, a, an anniversary of the Syrian uprising that was being demonstrated for in the streets of Syria, and they were waving Ukrainian flags at a lot of those demonstrations. And that said a lot to me, that in previous decades that may have been an American flag that people were waving, but that especially in Syria, where they have suffered from direct Russian attack, from direct Russian support for the civilian slaughter that has happened there, which we now see replicated in places in Ukraine, um, that they had Ukrainian flags as well. Uh, I think that says a lot about where we are in the war. So I'm going to ask one last brief question of our panelists, and then open it up to the audience. Uh, so think of questions, uh, and if you're a part of our online audience, feel free to send them, uh, and we'll try to get to you quickly. But maybe just from, uh, from each of you, just two or three brief points. Uh, looking ahead to the Vilnius summit, um, and considering what needs to happen to support Ukrainian victory, which we all agree needs to, needs to happen. Um, what specific advice would you offer to national or alliance leaders, whichever you think are most important? The President of the United States, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Baltic leaders, the Chancellor of Germany, uh, the Secretary General of NATO, whoever it is, what specific advice would you offer looking to the summit about what we need to achieve? Uh, and we'll start with uh, Birchu on this one. 
Thank you. Um, so, uh, looking ahead, uh, clearly at Vilnius, uh, we will um, uh, be looking at all the decisions that were taken in Madrid and uh, taking them f uh, forward and further. Um, I think we need to demonstrate that uh, we are able to uh, operate uh, under this heightened uh, risk uh, uh, environment. Uh, we need to uh, make sure uh, that uh, this uh, nuclear rhetoric uh, doesn't uh, weaken our resolve. Uh, in fact, up, up until now, I think we have been very clear uh, to put in that um, this will, it will not achieve uh, its objectives uh, through uh, threatening the use of uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, these, this rhetoric has neither compelled Ukraine uh, from uh, defending itself uh, nor halted uh, allies' uh, assistance uh, to Ukraine. So we have accelerated and need to co continue to accelerate our support. That will be, uh, I think, key in Vilnius as well. Um, we need to communicate, of course, our intent uh, uh, clearly and consistently. We, we should not give any room for misunderstanding. Therefore, this uh, concept of, uh, obviously, Article 5, uh, the ironclad um, commitment to it, um, and the fact that uh, every inch of alliance territory will be defended, again, uh, will be, uh, I think, uh, key uh, to uh, stress uh, and demonstrate uh, in Vilnius, uh, in including through substantial and persistent presence uh, of, uh, of our troops. Uh, um, and also enhanced uh, exercises. Um, uh, also, um, I think uh, one of the things that uh, the war uh, has shown is that we need to help uh, our partners sooner than later. Uh, and here uh, I would uh, say uh, one of the uh, partners at risk uh, in particular uh, is uh, Moldova. Uh, we've been um, uh, working uh, together with uh, our Moldovan colleagues uh, on uh, strengthening uh, NATO's support uh, through a defense uh, capacity building package. Um, and um, uh, our you know, call to allies is, uh, of course, uh, to um, uh, help uh, us implement uh, that package through in-kind assistance and also uh, contributions, financial contributions to the several projects that we have um, uh, come up with. Uh, we also, uh, the other uh, partners at risk uh, that we've identified are, of course, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia, and we uh, need to uh, redouble our efforts uh, in, in that regard as well. Um, for, for Ukraine itself, of course, um, what we need to do is uh, to um, demonstrate and implement uh, this uh, long-term uh, commitment. Uh, uh, first and foremost, uh, we are very much focused on, of course, uh, the, the war effort itself and this uh, lethal uh, assistance uh, and uh, NATO's own uh, non-lethal assistance projects uh, need to continue. We also have set in place a longer term uh, strategy and, and a program uh, to um, uh, foster our relations with Ukraine uh, really in, in, uh, in an endurable fashion. And uh, the um, most important, uh, perhaps, uh, element of uh, how we make sure the history doesn't repeat itself is uh, by uh, helping uh, the Ukrainian security and defense forces uh, to become uh, the um, capable forces that they are, but also even more uh, enshrined uh, and uh, uh, transitioned to NATO standards, NATO uh, procedures, uh, Western uh, technology, Western weapon systems, and to do this in a sustainable way and really, really uh, anchor them in that, re in that regard. Um, so um, to ensure that uh, we have our Ukrainian partners in, as a modernized uh, NATO interoperable and sustainable uh, uh, armed forces um, uh, with uh, the necessary procurement uh, processes uh, that, uh, that go with it, uh, that will be uh, also key, uh, I believe, in uh, going forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Ben? Well, obviously, I hope that we'll have uh, closure on Sweden and Finland uh, being uh, accessed into the alliance by then. I, I, obviously, I think it looks pretty certain with Finland, Sweden, not so much, but uh, it really would be, uh, um, I think, such a powerful Thing that we get that sorted out before before the summer, and, and you can and do that, announce that there. That would uh, that would be powerful. Um, I would uh, love to see coming out of this summit a uh, a statement about the Black Sea region and NATO having a strategy for the Black Sea region. Uh, with all respect, and, and virtue, you you are a professional communicator. I just have a big mouth. Um, I, this statement, defend every inch of NATO territory, I think is unhelpful 
Because what it does, it communicates is we're not going to defend anywhere else. And I don't know that it's helpful to say, I mean, I've always assumed that we would defend every inch of NATO. That's what Article 5 is all about. So I don't know that that's helpful. But So I wish that the, would, I would hope that one of the things coming out will be an announcement that we are going to have a strategy for the greater Black Sea region that is comprehensive in all domains. And, uh, and that would include something that approaches the beginning of a security guarantee for Ukraine, uh, uh, rotational forces in Ukraine, uh, maritime maxing out. Uh, I mean, we don't even come close to using the number of days we could use in the Black Sea for our Navy within Montreux Convention. I mean, we're not even 50 percent. We could be doing so much more there. So Montreux is not a restriction. Um, it's the fact is the Black Sea has never been high enough priority to put more ships there. And so having a strategy would, would change that. And um, I think this, this should be one of the uh, emerging themes. And then finally, this is going to sound kind of tedious, but it's also kind of important. Uh, this phrase, enable the SACURS AOR, we're not doing it. This is about logistics. It's about military mobility. It's about air and missile defense. It's about getting it right so that we can, in fact, fight effectively. Uh, one of the holdovers from the uh, Cold War days um, was the notion that each nation is responsible for their own logistics. That, that is ridiculous. It's also completely impossible. Uh, you can't just be responsible for your own logistics, certainly not nowadays when we've got organ, uh, units that are integrated at the company, battalion, and brigade level. Now, when Roderick and I were lieutenants 100 years ago, where you had a German Corps and a, an American Corps, it made sense. Not today. And so we've got to, we've got to focus on fixing the enablement of the SACUR's air of responsibility. Alex. Oh, if, uh, if I could advise for NATO leaders, I will say for, for <clears throat> six, six, six things. First, it's to, to be ready to quickly mobilize the defense industry, all, all needs, and for coalition armed forces, and combine private companies with the logistics of armed forces and efficiently uh, be and as possible to, to be quickly in this. This is what the general um, says right now. The strength and the interaction of intelligence services, uh, not only context and information exchange, but provide uh, 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 operations, which is means human human intelligence is a different one, other operation, informational, undercover operations, uh, because it's not enough for for face the asymmetric. Warfare, hybrid warfare, it's not enough to just exchange, exchange of information. We, we have to uh, uh, do it together. Adapt decision making procedure for emergency situations. First of all, it's, it's mean, uh, if we have a threat for uh, allied countries or NATO, NATO members of uh, using nuclear weapon or tactical nuclear weapon, weapon firstly, because it's a, a permanent threat from Russian, Russian sides, or how we can, can react for the incident if uh, another American drones will be shot down by Russians or uh, f fight jet with, with the pilot inside. Uh, and I think uh, as soon as NATO reaches a level of living strong and quickly response organism, it will be it's f just this, this fact it will be most serious deterrent of potential enemies because all of them will understand the NATO will react very quickly and very effectively because now they try to use in the low speed of reactions and a lot of political tensions before they will NATO to make any decisions. If we're saying about Ukraine, I will just ask to provide us a weapon, especially long-range weapon, uh, to win this war, because it's, we have a great asymmetric state and right now. Russians are using the cruise missiles with a 2,000 kilometers range, uh, uh, and we use only 17. It's very difficult to fight in this way. It's not not even we spoke, don't didn't speak about I don't speak about aviation. It's long range missiles as a first, first of us, and. Uh, 
especially care about Black Sea region uh, security because it's a food security, first of all, food security for Middle East and for Africa. And as will be known, Russian tried to use it to make a new Ar Arab Spring uh, because of the hunger, hunger uh, clashes in this country. And it will be a great threat for Europe by the waves of the refugees. And we, we will still manage with the food security properly. And uh, after, at last but not at least, uh, just help us. We couldn't, uh, the main problem of Ukraine, we, we could we win this war, but we couldn't lose uh, the peace after that. Because we're still a weak country with a lot of corruption, with a lot of, uh, with a um, uh, determined industry, uh, uh, 12 million people from us are uh, moving out from the, their houses. And the, Post-war reconstruction of Ukraine it's be, will be more and more challenge, more serious challenges than the win, win this war. So we ask, we will ask, I will ask NATO leaders to help us do not lo lose the peace after winning the war. It's the main, main goal for us and for for Ukraine. If, if we have strong Ukraine, we already the most provider of uh, strongest provider security in Western in Eastern Europe, and we will even with the West has. Uh, allied strong Ukraine, it will be completely change of uh, system of security in, in the Euro Europe, Asia, Asia region. And will we show the China and another, Iran and other countries that West is still strong and West will be strong. And Roderick. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. We should not underestimate what you, Oleksii, just said to win the peace after the war regarding perspectives for the population in Ukraine. Uh, five very brief proposals or deliberations, better to say. Um, first of all, there is a strong need for a commitment, to achieve a commitment on a common goal. What is the aim of NATO or of the International Alliance for Ukraine? I believe it should be Ukraine must win instead of Ukraine should not lose or Russia should not win. We have to change this narrative because all others are including lines of armistice, uh, Minsk III or something like that. We cannot afford that. This includes also the borders of Ukraine as of 2013, better to say as of 1991. And to accept that Ukraine was a nuclear country, has handed over the nuclear weapons and has got security guarantees which were not worth the paper they were on. So we need security guarantees including nuclear guarantees, that means the best would be NATO membership. And as you just mentioned, a plan after the war regarding traumatization built up. Also the Marshall Plan was started in 1941 when the Operation Barbarossa not yet has begun. So we have to think really in this context. Second, um, we have to speed up interoperability and standardization in the defense industry as of today, we are too slow. We have too many types of, of, of weapons inside Europe. We have to cooperate more transatlantically. The European Defence Fund must be opened for NATO cooperation, also trans, in, in the transatlantic area. Third, we have to improve the armaments industry's capabilities. Very important, not only in competition with other areas like South Korea, which is now very close to Poland in this context, but we have to improve our European capabilities to make them competitive. Fourth, strategic communications. As I mentioned a little bit earlier today, we need to convince our populations that Ukraine has to win. And second, we have to make NATO and NATO policies attractive for like-minded states and partners in the world. And fifth and last, um, the lessons identified and lessons learned process from this war. We should see in the perspective of Russia, of China, of other spoilers or powers in the world, what do they draw for lessons from this war so that we are prepared for that, to become more agile, more liquid, looking to Iran and his activities in Iraq or China as regards Taiwan, only to, only to mention two examples. So these are my five cents. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's been a theme today is uh, certainly in the US and I believe in Europe as well, there's been a lot of 
Russia or China sort of false choices being made. And I think what we've seen certainly from the Xi visit and, uh, and even before is it's Russia and China and the common worldview they represent. And it is one common front uh, that we need to, uh, to deal with in the context of Ukraine and otherwise. Um, good, I'll do one quick question from uh, our online audience, uh, probably for Ben, which I think you can do very briefly because you do this a lot. But um, how will Euro-Atlantic security environment, how will the Euro-Atlantic security environment change after the accession of Sweden and Finland to NATO? If you could just do that briefly. Yeah, NATO gets better the second that uh, Finland and Sweden are in the alliance. I mean, the geography, obviously, is a huge advantage. Uh, total control of the Baltic Sea, um, it, the potential for that, if necessary. Uh, but also, you're talking about two nations that have very strong, resilient societies, uh, good emerging modern defense industries. And um, I think two more, you're adding two more liberal democratic societies that will, that will reinforce all the positive the values that we talk about. I, there are zero, zero downsides that I, that I can see. Great, yeah, I think the preparedness point is a good one. I know you mentioned Finland earlier. Sweden obviously has sort of the same internal culture of preparedness that they've been building, especially again over the past decade. I think within NATO, the only one that comes close is Estonia, and I'm not crapping on everyone else, but um, uh, in terms of readiness of reserves and constant mobilization, I think that's the only uh, near peer. Um, okay, any questions from the audience? What do we have? Let's do, let's take you and you, and we'll do those together, uh, and then we'll see who should answer. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Roman Kowalczuk, uh, Warsaw-based uh, East European Strategic Forum. Uh, my question is for Mr. Arestovich. Um, what uh, uh, prevents uh, uh, the government of Ukraine from allowing um, uh, foreign nationals uh, to obtain officers rank uh, in the Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, so for uh, Belarusian battalions and detachments uh, is uh, crucial uh, to get access uh, to uh, NATO uh, uh, education system. And also it's uh, essential uh, to get uh, armored cars, uh, tanks, uh, heavy weapons, some air support, uh, tactical air defense. Uh, and uh, Belarusian state uh, in exile uh, does not see any ground for reconciliation uh, with the Lukashenko regime or the Putin, the aggressors. So Lukashenko's days should be over with the defeat of Russia. Thank you. You mean, first of all, the uh, Kalinovsky regiment, yes? Uh, yes, and other detachments, and they, they, smaller they detachments. So for, uh, for your opinion, yeah, they have uh, some problems with the weapon, yes? And weaponry. No, I, I could ask Mr. Zaluzhny, which is a friend of mine from the, my, my military school, about 30 years, and uh, try to uh, do, do my best for, for provide them. But we, we, we have to understand that there's a lot of problem for, for us, because our army uh, increase manpower from, 10, from the four times. It's an, almost a million people right now that in the, with rifles, and we need a lot of weaponry. It's a difficult one. My friend of mine now is fighting near the Bakhmut, which is friend, my, my best friend from the military school. He is a uh, deputy brigade commander. And he says we have nothing. Nothing. Just nothing. No, no, no anti-tank uh, rockets, no, no, uh, no gr gr grenade launchers and something like this because it's a very, very heavy fighting. A lot of weaponry is just damaged in the war and we need more, more and more still. And this is a problem. But if the Kalinovsky regiment has a huge problem, it's a big problem, I will ask for Mr. Zaluzhny, okay? I, I promise you. Just right now, after finishing this panel, <laughs> okay? What about Mr. Lukashenko? We know it's a difficult situation with us because um, we don't uh, believe he is a law, a president in law in Belarus, and we, but we understand he's an effective leading of Belarus and Belarus. Our main interest, interest right now, do not give ability for Mr. Putin and Mr. Lukashenko to bring 
uh, Belarusian army in the war. And we didn't want to kill any Belarusian, one Belarusian person by Ukrainian shells or bombs. We don't want to give this remember for, for Belarusian people that any Ukrainians kill any Belarusians. Because we believe when the Mr. Putin go out and Mr. Lukashenko do the same things and Belarusia will be free. We don't need any any case for Ukrainian strike for Belarusian or, or, shell, or shoot into Belarusian, no. And it's a difficult way to do this because a Belarusian regime under the Mr. Lukashenko providing still in uh, military aggression against Ukraine. But we hold the situation uh, and we will hold them in the future. And I'm just going to emphasize the point that our Ukrainian uh, friend has made here uh, because I think you live it every day so you get tired of repeating it. But uh, Ukraine built uh, an entire army a year ago and then had to build an entire second one uh, just after that. Uh, so it's not just that they don't have fighters and tanks and anti-tank weaponry, it's that there's a need for literally everything. And I know you in the Baltics know this better than most of the Alliance because you are constantly uh, sending supplies of all kinds uh, from here to Ukraine. Uh, but for those of us who are watching from afar, uh, it is a good reminder that Ukraine needs everything. Uh, not just uh, airplanes and tanks. No, I just, just one yeah, yeah. point. We, we, coll we collect all weapons we have for the brigades we will provide counter-offensive. We have to concentrate. It's the one the mo most military principle. We have to concentrate concentrate all power we have for the main, main goal and for, 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 main, for main movement. Um, another, another battalions and other brigades still need to be provided very properly. And so we have no, nothing or almost nothing for fighting was the Russian waves of people, waves of tanks, waves of, of shells. It's a very difficult situation, really, in the Bakhmut and, 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 other, uh, and, and other hot points. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Robert Yuatka. I'm a member of the Lithuanian Rifleman Union and also founder of the National Defense Association and, and board member of the Lithuanian Defense Industry Association. So a question, obviously, probably to Mr. General uh, Ben Hodges. Uh, well, uh, continuing on the discussion of the weaponry supply. So, so uh, we understand that uh, you know definitely Ukraine needs long-range weapons, rockets, uh, especially. They are expensive. There are a few of them. We understand. I mean, why a few of them have been delivered, or more could have been delivered, but but not. Uh, but uh, we have, as much as I know. Uh, from open sources. We have around 6,000 uh, retired Bradley vehicles, M2 Bradley vehicles, uh, M2 uh, version, I mean, Bradley vehicles. Um, so uh, they are being retired, about 6,000 of them. About 100 is being now sent to Ukraine, but why couldn't it be 1,000? You know, they are being retired anyway. So that would make a huge difference. Well, I'm retired, and so uh, I would not be much help uh, either. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm sorry. Um, look, this goes back to uh, political uh, decision. And, you know, if the president um, of my country cannot say, I want Ukraine to win, then we're going to continue making these incremental decisions about, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to provoke Russia or we just want to make sure Ukraine doesn't lose. So as with every every conflict, it starts at the top. And the president has to say, we want to win. When he says, we want to win, then all the excuses about, oh, too, too much fuel for an Abrams tank, or it'll take too long to train, or, you know, it's too hard, all that shit goes away. And everything would be delivered quickly, but it, it's going to take the decision, we want Ukraine to win. Now, I personally don't like to talk about specific weapons because you can get into an argument about, well, you know, it'll take this many weeks to train them here and, you know, the Abrams tank. I mean, I, as I listened to our de Defense Department, I wondered why do we have 4,000 Abrams if they're so bad? And, and because they were using all these excuses why not to send them. Um, I think what I prefer to do is talk about what is the effect that we want to help Ukraine achieve. If we want Ukraine to win, what will help them win? Liberating Crimea is how Ukraine wins. They liberate Crimea, nobody will care about Bakhmut. 
I mean, you could kill every Russian soldier within 200 kilometers of Bakhmut, and it would not change the strategic situation. You liberate Crimea, that changes everything. So what do they need to liberate Crimea? They need long-range precision strike capability that will enable them to isolate the Crimean Peninsula and then make that place untenable for Russian forces. Black Sea Fleet has to leave. I mean, if Ukraine had eight TACOMs now, that's 300 kilometers. The Black Sea Fleet would have already left and would be hiding in Nova Rossiysk. okay? Um, so uh, I listened to General Cavoli a few months ago. He said, um, precision can defeat mass if you have enough time. So the only advantage the Russians have is mass. So with precision, you defeat, you destroy headquarters, you destroy ammunition storage, and you destroy transportation. Then they could have a million little uh, Wagnerites wandering around out there. That's not going to be an effective force. So precision capability is what will make the difference, I think. But we have to say we want Ukraine to win. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, any other, qu one last question here? Yeah, hi, uh, Sean Griffiths. My company provides uh, a number of different defense products. I just recently returned from Ukraine. Um, my question is to uh, Colonel Arestovich and the, and the rest of the panel at large. What, um, what we found in Ukraine on our visit was that the procurement process for, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises, was a bit hard to navigate. And are there steps in place to streamline that? And what are those? Uh, I would recommend that that be centralized in some sort of fashion for a number of firms, innovators, and uh, smaller companies that, that want to come in from Europe and the United States that produce technologies and conventional munitions and things like that to be able to navigate the process within the Ukrainian military and then source funding from outside the country. You touch the point that I hate so much <laughs> because our system is do not provide ability to little and small private business to get in defense, defense industry. It's as a one, one of the, our most weakness point. And I really hate it because I'm a military. I'm a, I completely understand what means fight by the empty hands. I fight two and a half years on the, with Russians, and I completely understand what does it mean. And <clears throat> it's our big problem. And we, t we, we try to get a best decision for, for decide is this. If you know, it's a weeks ago, it was a, a Ukra Baron Prom company with. Uh, resign it for another form of uh, privacy and uh, we we get new minister of the strategic industry which is alexander uh, who is a, who is a very honest and very good manager i still it's another another sort of five attempt to to manage this problem and I believe he could do something with this because it's a very, very, very great problem. It's a lot of corruptions, if be honest. And uh, it's need, we need the boss society, non-government organization, business and uh, government efforts to, to manage with this. Because it's still Soviet... Uh, it's Soviet links, you know, because it's the most corruption. Corruption in post-Soviet countries, the military industry is the most the most corruption things. A lot of money, and uh, you, 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 we can hide any problem by by the top secret top secret science, you know. We have, even the war do not give us ability, whole ability to manage with this, but we 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 try. I'm spoke about this and speak about this every every my uh, speaking in the media about this problem my my own best dream it's to unite the business government and science in ukraine to, to make this triangle to and then increase our military industry force because it's a point of the growth growing and it is a, is a main condition of living ukrainian nation you know but it's still a great problem 
I completely understand. A lot of uh, all of us understand what this is a problem, and we, we try to manage. It. And I think there are some uh, really talented Ukrainian tech entrepreneurs who want to help address this problem. Uh, we have one last question from uh, Mr. Kubilius, who we will of course always make time for. Though I promised Ben we would end on time, so go. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. Yes, my name is Andrew Kubilius. I was in this building for last uh, almost, uh, I don't remember, 30 years, maybe now a uh, member for European Parliament. And also, uh, uh, we initiated some kind of parliamentary network united for Ukraine. Uh, my question would be maybe to General Hojas, I don't know to whom, but, you know, well, we are talking about uh, deterrence. Uh, uh, capabilities, deterrence of authoritarian Russia. And you, you know, spoke in a very clear way that, you know, the leadership in the West uh, is still not deciding. Uh, are they going, you know, are they supporting really uh, Ukrainian victory or just allowing Ukraine not to, you know, not to lose? Why is that? I have two, you know, two answers. One is that really, you know, Americans, let's say, are afraid of provoking Russia. You know, Russia is threatening with nuclear weapons, as you have said. Second, you know, as we hear from Washington cabinets, some rumors or let's say some info, also there is, you know, fear that if Ukrainians are defeating with Western assistance Russia, so Russia is collapsing, total chaos, you know, no control for uh, you know, for nuclear weapons, and so on and so on. So, which version you would say is more truthful? And second, what can we do? Because that, on that depends our deterrence capabilities. If we shall not convince the West that consequences of Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian victory you know, can be even positive for Russian developments, then we shall stay in the same situation as we have now. No, you know, long, long range, you know, missiles, no, no real weapons, and so on and so on. So, in general, my question is about, you know, uh, consequences of uh, Ukrainian victory. How to convince the West not to be afraid of Ukrainian total defeat of Russian army? Um, I will offer just a brief comment, but I would really like to hear what uh, my friend uh, Roderick also has to say. He'll have a German perspective on this, I think, which will be very useful for all of us. I do think that there is fear in Washington that um, of what happens after Ukraine defeats Russia. I mean, what, what would it be? I still hear smart people say, oh, it could be somebody worse. I don't know how it could be anybody worse than Vladimir Putin, but there are still people that worry about that. Uh, and to be candid, I think there also are people that have built an entire career on the belief that somehow you could, that Russia was this other great power that we should deal with them. And so that will be hard, hard to swallow, I think, for a lot of people. And, and there are a lot of people in this administration now that were part of the Obama administration that were very reluctant to hold Russia accountable. And so I, I think there's a combination of factors. I don't have a Clear answer, though. Thank you, Ben. Um, I've also not a clear answer, but I'm a retired colonel, and in 2008, uh, I was in the Secures Office as XO to the Chief of Staff of Shape, and we got a request from General Craddock at that time, the Germans to deliver tornado fighters, aircrafts, to uh, Afghanistan, and we drafted a letter to the chancellor, and within a fortnight we became an answer. And the first side of the letter was, yes, you will get the tornadoes. And the second side was, but only use the camera <laughs> and not close air support. So first answer try to is the reluctance inside Germany coming from pacifism, re-education, and the very difficult change of mood from a receiver of security to become a provider of security. But in my opinion, this took 20 years too long. Until 1990, we were receivers of security, and it took 
at least 10, 15 years to change this mindset that we also need to give something back to provide security. Second remark, it's a fear in Germany for a collapsed Russia. We shouldn't be fearful. There is also a Russia, what we call the Russia of Hannah Arendt and, uh, and uh, Thomas Mann. So there are wise women and men in Russia who are working for a new, more democratic and more substantial Russia, learning to lose and learning to give up all the colonial uh, adherences and so on. And third, it is in two parties in Germany, a strong Russian romanticism, believing that, like Mackinder, the, the heartland theory, that Russian resources and Germany's engineers' art might bring a new future to Europe. So this romanticism really cites, lines out all countries in between. And it is a very bad tradition in Germany. Since 1812, Clausewitz was supporting the Tsar against Napoleon. In 1917, the German Emperor's army supported Ulyan of Lenin to, to, to start the revolution. And then in the 20s, the gratitude of the Soviet Union, uh, you see it in the Rapallo Treaty, to build up the German tank weapon. And the, the Tigers, and the leopards, they are all related to the Russian the Soviet support in the 20s. And later on, the Ribbentrop-Molotov uh, uh, Treaty, and those who have written this treaty as young referees or as young, uh, uh, as young uh, officials and officers, they were in the 60s and created and drafted the Mannesmann tube uh, 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 enterprise, so the, the tube uh, uh, um, commitment regarding the, the gas line from, from, and oil lines from uh, the Soviet Union to Germany. And then in the tradition Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. And you find this in the Social Democratic Party and you find this in a less number also in the Christian Democratic Union. The belief that a cooperation with Russia is better than to be adversaries. And this is wrong. We have to overcome this due to um, a lot of mistakes in the past. And therefore, I believe one explanation is the lack of political will to have a clear stand and to see what is wrong and what is right and what is evil and what is helping the international rule-based order to survive. And in a position in between, Germany will lose not only um, its, credi its credibility, but also its impact. And therefore, there is a need of a, of a mind change to become an advocate for freedom and also a voice in Washington and in Brussels for the security needs of Middle and Eastern Europe. And not only to be a mediator or a referee or somebody who is excellent in explaining, we need to have a clear standpoint. And this is one of the lessons learned I'm working on with colleagues uh, during this war, that we have to change this mindset in Germany. We have to have a clear position. And this is probably one of the explanations, the shying away, the shy of clear positions. We cannot afford to stay in between. So before, before I thank our panelists, because I know Ben has to run to the airport, um, uh, I would just say, I think this issue of mindset uh, and of actually understanding that this is about making the projection of our power useful uh, from Washington, from Berlin uh, especially, uh, is something I would really like to see uh, our collective administrations embrace a bit more. And I think the fear of Ukrainian victory, uh, the fear of a destabilizing or collapsing Russia, uh, both come from the same wrong understanding of the last hundred years of history, which you in this region understand better than most of us. Uh, and we need to keep talking about it, because uh, it's the thing that will actually help uh, change this. Yes, Russia will bear a terrible cost for destabilizing from its current system of complete internal control by a terrible corrupt regime, but why should Russia's neighbors have to bear that cost now? And why should we have to bear the cost of that now? And that's what we're facing, and we refuse to look at it. So with that, I want to thank our panelists uh, for a really good discussion. Uh, thank you, audience, for questions. Um, and we'll have another coffee break now, or is it lunch now? Lunch now, and then uh, our, our next panel, I think. Yeah.
Thank you. Excellent discussion. Uh, and now uh, we will have one hour break, so uh, we have a lunch. So our guests uh, are welcome to, to join us for the lunch. Uh, and after one hour, starting uh, uh, 1 p.m., we will have uh, the last session about the future of deterrent strategy. And I think we selected the best what uh, we have, but we, uh, we, we will have uh, American, Swedish, Polish uh, uh, panel uh, uh, with uh, concluding remarks by Ukrainian experts. So I think this is the best who can decide the future of the deterrence. So we have a nice uh, lunch and we will, we, will, we will be waiting for you after that.
Okay, uh, good afternoon, and uh, now please uh, let me introduce the new panel. Uh, the last but not least, uh, we have panel on the future deterrent strategy, so the, the panel will be talking about the future, and I would like to introduce you uh, the moderator, uh, Ms. Rebecca Hendricks, and she is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and the director of Keystone Defense in Initiative. She specializes in, in the US national defense policy with a focus on strategic deterrence. So, Rebecca, floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you to my get, to the hosts for putting on this wonderful conference. I've already benefited so much from the previous panels, and so um, it's just a real privilege to be able to be here moderating this wonderful panel. I think that how we're going to do this today is I am going to provide very brief introductions, um, just give the names since you have their biographies there in front of you, um, and then uh, I'll provide some initial remarks myself and then kick it off down, down to my right um, for their responses to some of what I say and some initial remarks, and then, and then we'll have a conversation. And then I hope to leave plenty of time for questions um, from folks online who are paying attention to this and then for y'all in the audience. Directly to my right, we have Mr. Michael Malm, Swedish Armed Forces Defense Staff, Department of Total Defense. Uh, thrilled to have him here with us. Um, then we have uh, retired General Yarslov Strolzik? How is that for my Ohio accent? Is that okay? Okay. Um, University of Workclub, former Deputy Director of the International Intelligence Director of the NATO Military <laughs> Staff. And then my friend and colleague, uh, Mr. Marshall Billingsley. He is the former Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing at the U.S. Department of the Treasury and, under, and former Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security Affairs. And then uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Professor, Professor Richard, Richard uh, Mashinikowski, Dean of the Faculty of International and Political Studies, University of Lodz, Poland. How did I do? Was that okay? Forgive me for my failure to do it so perfectly. Um, so the, the topic of our, con of our panel today is we're going to be talking about future deterrence architecture. And so uh, based on a lot of the remarks that we're, we've already heard today, I think it's important perhaps if we grapple with what we mean by deterrence, um, put a definition on it perhaps, and then, and then have a conversation about whether or not it is our assessment uh, that, that uh, we didn't try to deter Russia uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, my definition of deterrence is that deterrence is convincing the adversary that an act of aggression that he is considering will not be worth his desired aim. So by that, so it is, it is deterrence is something that is defined by what the adversary actually concludes. By that definition, we failed, we collectively, uh, the NATO alliance, but I would um, uh, put a lot of the, of the blame for this. Um, I think it's important to distinguish, obviously, ultimately the blame is, is Putin and his decision to invade Ukraine, but the failure to deter, um, I think, uh, belongs with those who tried to deter uh, Putin, and that's the United States and, and, our, and our effort to lead the alliance. Um, in, uh, and, and, I, and I've described I've described Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 as the the largest the largest deterrence failure um, uh, since the since the Second World War. Now it's small d deterrence because clearly, as others have pointed out, strategic deterrence has held. 
NATO has not been attacked, um, and um, there has not been a strategic weapon employed in this conventional war against Ukraine um, at this point. And so um, that is good, um, but, but I think it's important that we evaluate um, what led to this failure of deterrence lest we do it again. Um, there, there were, leading up to Russia's in decision to invade Ukraine, multiple indications that Russia was considering um, an act of aggression and, and pressing and testing the United States and NATO. And I'm going to just outline a couple of them. The first one was uh, the United States' decision not to enforce congressionally mandated sanctions on Nord Stream 2. The second one was pursuing a cyber dialogue with the Russians as Russia continued to attack the United States the infrastructure. And then the US president um, being unclear or perhaps being too clear that there would be some targets that would be tolerated and some targets that would not be. Essentially leaving the door open for continued cyber attacks against the United States. When there was a, a congressionally authorized and the DOD produced presidential drawdown authority of weapons to Ukraine, the United States chose not to actually deliver those on the hopes that, that, would, that, that there was still time to negotiate with the Russians and that by doing so, providing weapons to Ukraine, that that would be too provocative. <coughs> and then after that happened in 2021, again, there was another um, hundreds of millions of dollars of aid already authorized that was delayed to Ukraine. I thought General Hodges made some great points about what Ukraine could have done also to make themselves uh, stronger, to, to, to demonstrate that they would have the will and the ability to defend themselves. And of course, that, that didn't happen either. So there's plenty of blame to go around. But um, since I'm here as an American, oh, I should have pointed out too, although I, I wear several hats uh, working for the United States government, I'm here only representing my own views, although my government is welcome to adopt my views as theirs. Um, and, and so I could go down the line. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that the Russians did was uh, they launched that anti-satellite attack, again, taking out their the very highly provocative acts, spewing lots of dangerous space debris, again, you know, over and above U.S. Uh, objections and telling them not to do it, um, endangering our astronauts that were just uh, sent to the International Space Station, directly putting them in peril. So there was lots of things that led up to the, to the invasion of Ukraine, unrelated to Ukraine directly, but certainly um, that signaled that the United States was still trying to, um, to sort of uh, try another kind of reset with the Russians to try to smooth over some um, um, uh, bumpy road, um, but instead that weakness um, instead had the other effect and, and the Russians, of course, invaded. And then I would also just say, too, our own officials said that, that they tried to deter Russia by the threat of economic sanctions. And um, by, by doing other good things, I think, like st communicating to our NATO allies what we knew the Russians were doing, and I think that that was a helpful and good thing, but it certainly didn't contribute to successful deterrence. Um, and so, uh, so, so from my perspective, uh, clearly deterrence failed in that regard. And then um, I can talk about what some things I think the United States and our, and our allies are still continuing to do that is not actually uh, helping Ukraine to actually prevail over Russia, which is something that should be our goal clearly stated, and then develop a strategy to do that and then resource that strategy. So with those uncontroversial remarks, I'm going to turn, the, turn over the floor um, to my right. Hello. <clears throat> um, I will start uh, by giving some of the assessment that the Swedish Armed Forces is giving uh, on the situation right now. Um, I think that's a proper start, and then I will talk about deterrence. Uh, right now, we say that we cannot exclude anything, and that also means that we do not exclude an intervention with nuclear weapons in Europe. That's part of our thinking now when we are doing our defense planning. Uh, secondly, uh, there is also um, important to understand that we are a potential target uh, for Russian aggression since we are uh, supporting uh, Ukraine with uh, advanced weapons. And that's something that we are talking to our businesses uh, in, in the country uh, very much about. 
Uh, and that means that we have to have a sort of more alertness than normally, uh, so to speak. And things can change extremely quick. Uh, that's also part of uh, our preparation right now. And all of this, a all, all, little bit more in, uh, in detail, of course, uh, we communicate to the, the public sector, to the uh, private sector, and to the civil society, because they are all part of the tool defense. Okay, uh, turning to, to deterrence. Um, this was my question I asked myself. Do we really understand uh, deterrence? Do we really understand what it means? Do we really understand uh, what it takes? Do we really understand what kind of demands uh, that uh, really uh, is if we are talking about real deterrence? And uh, as you said, Rebecca, probably, probably not. Um, if we understand it, do we also understand what kind of necessary actions uh, we need to take? And I have uh, another definition. Sorry. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my definition, not necessarily the defense staff's definition of, of uh, what deterrence is all about. Um, and as you can see, uh, we need to understand fear. Fear is the key. Uh, and we understand, we have to understand what are our fears and what are opponent fears. If we don't understand fear, we will not understand deterrence. And I think we have failed to understand fear or even accept fear because that's uh, essential. Uh, and why do we do that? Why have we failed to understand fear? Well, we are all different. Some of us are more different than others. Um, I always thought that Sweden was a sort of a middle, middle road country. Um, we, ha we are called the Mellanmjölkens land. Mellanmjölk is milk. It's not too fat and it's not too whatever it is. We are always in the middle. But according to this, we are extremists. Uh, and uh, of course, if you, if you look at this map, uh, you could argue that people have different cultures, of course. We have learned to think, feel, and, and act differently, uh, and we need to understand that. Uh, and I don't think we understand this uh, good enough, what it really means. Uh, so that's why I'm always surprised why not everybody thinks, feels, and acts like a Swede, because we are the most normal people in the world. Um, do you agree? Or? Of course. Yeah. It's Friday. Yeah. Friday afternoon. Great. Um, and oop. this means that we need to understand two things. Can you see it? Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. No. Uh, here you have importance. You can't see the word importance. Um, and you have a risk appetite. And of course, if we are all different, we have different things that are important to us, what we think are vital. If I ask my kids what's the most vital thing you have in your life, they say, they say Wi-Fi. Uh, and uh, the living standard is something that my, perhaps my friends would say, uh, to, to be able to travel, to be able to live the good life. Uh, and what kind of risks are we willing to take? What kind of risk appetite do we have? Uh, or pain tolerance. Uh, what kind of pain tolerance do we have in order to achieve things that are important to us? And I don't really think that uh, we fully understand for, uh, for ourselves uh, what's a vital interest to us and what we are then willing to risk. And we don't understand our opponents, what's so vital to them and how, how they view that uh, importance and what kind of risks they are willing to take or what kind of pain they can tolerate. Uh, and this is perhaps something that we need to be more, uh, to discuss more, both internally in Sweden, what's important to us uh, and what's important to our opponents and what are we willing to risk and what are they willing to risk and how do we cope with that equation. Because finally, I will keep this short, uh, finally, 
I think there are two questions that we need to ask ourselves, and I will show that in just a little while. Um, what I think this means that when we talk about deterrence, of course, the military aspect, the armed forces, is the backbone of def uh, deterrence. But we have to have, if we are going to have a total defense, we need also need to have total deterrence, a comprehensive view on deterrence, so we can deter our foes in, uh, on many lines of operations at the same time. Uh, so the comprehensive the comprehensiveness of deterrence is extremely essential. Um, but we're, the basic questions that we need to ask ourselves are... Well, <clears throat> what are they willing to die for and suffer for? And what are we really willing to suffer and die for? And if we haven't answered that question ourselves properly, we will never understand deterrence. Thank you, that was uh, wonderful and sobering, Michael. Um, I'm gonna turn it over then to Yaroslav. You can stick with this theme of deterrence, and then we'll move down whether or not the United States successfully did, or whether or not Ru Russia was successfully deterred as well, um, and what we possibly could have done to do that. Uh, thank you, good afternoon, and it's a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, uh, I changed my mind a bit about what words I should say after the previous panel, uh, because I believe that we should be very frank and we have to have solid assessment and frank assessment about our current status of deterrence and the last year uh, to, to speak about the future and how should we act in the future. Um, I wouldn't tell you too much about my struggle to convince when I was Deputy Director of Intelligence at NATO HQ 2010-2013 to convince all the ambassadors uh, and sometimes military officials that Russia is a, a threat. We did, we did this with our Lithuanian and some other countries' friends, uh, from, our from other countries' uh, friends, uh, but we simply failed. So, uh, of course, we can learn by mistakes, that's a, that's a good, uh, good effort. Uh, but those, uh, those frank words that were sa said during the, our previous panel uh, by, by, by Rederick Kiesewetter and uh, General Hodges uh, should be the base for our discussion, I believe. Uh, should we, how should we assess last year in terms of deterrence? Uh, uh, with my very frank assessment, that's a lost year. Uh, that's a lost year because we haven't done enough. We haven't done enough in terms outside the military. We might have some, I would say, successes in terms of providing equipment, of buying equipment, also in Poland. But we haven't done too much to have this total defense or total resilience approach within our countries. It seems to be still temporary. Uh, we haven't done so much... <laughs> <clears throat> we haven't done enough, in my opinion, to prepare our countries uh, from a logistical point of view, uh, from other points of view as well, cyber defense. Uh, we, of course, heavily invested within militaries. Uh, but uh, um, coming back to the discussions I had, we had a migrant crisis in Poland as well, Lithuania, in 2021. Uh, we had some logistical problems also within Polish military, that, that was quite obvious. And from the discussions from last year I had with some, uh, that was mentioned also by, by Oleksii, uh, with, about entrepreneurs, about um, owners of big and medium, and also private, I mean private, all private, but also small uh, uh, um, owners, uh, that there is no cooperation. There is a group in Poland of, of, of uh, medium size and big size entrepreneurs, owners. Uh, uh, they would like to support, they would like to have their own mark uh, inside the system. When you go through Poland, through highways, on the left and right, you have enormous magazines, enormous logistical systems from all over Europe, the best ones. So the question I had from one of them was why the hell is it possible that we have the best private system in Europe, somehow, 
and then we have some failures in terms of log logistics. And we know from the from this from these lessons from last year that logistics is key. Logistics is key, and uh, the the survival, the production of ammunition, and this is something we haven't done, and we haven't invested too much. I don't think we have still plans to to build some infrastructure which should be of dual use, should be of strategic uh, uh, purposes. So this is, this is my, my point about logistics. Um, so we are speaking about deterrence. I recall uh, the, the beginning of the discussion, like 15 years ago, we are speaking about reassurance. That was the beginning of the discussion. But from my side, from my, uh, from my field, which is very close, from intelligence point of view, uh, speaking about NATO, uh, from my perspective, there is lack of big ideas and new initiatives. When we look to the, to the sky, to the flight radar, we know what is, what is successful. We know from this story about uh, MQ-9 Reaper, which was down uh, at the Black Sea area two weeks ago. This is, this is a success. One of the successes of NATO was the AGS, Alliance Ground Surveillance System, built, uh, started to be built like 10 years ago. Uh, so the point is, if we don't start some new initiatives or rebuilding some aging AWACS system, for example, now, we will not have this capability in five, ten years' time. So we, we need, that's, that's my point, some new uh, pretty heavy initiatives within NATO uh, just for cooperation. It was even said during the, our previous panel that we don't have cooperation in terms of buying new systems. Of course, Poland is buying a lot. Uh, uh, I don't agree, it was said during the previous panel, that South Korea is closer to Poland now because we bought so many, so many tanks and howitzers in, 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 uh, and also planes in South Korea. That is not true. I mean, we need to produce ammunition by ourselves to have the maintenance systems. And that applies to also other countries. There is no... Uh, I am outside government and I am not representing government. I don't think that they can take my points, uh, but, uh, but we need this cooperation between those countries, between, our, between Poland, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. We need perhaps some common systems, uh, at least to try to have uh, uh, some of them. So that's, this were, I would say, my, my initial points uh, to, to this discussion. And uh, I recall, uh, concluding my remarks, I recall Gen Secretary General Robertson who was saying always that capability creates credibility, and that should be, I believe, uh, well, uh, well, uh, also um, taken during our next meetings to include Vilnius summit. Thank you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Marshall. If you could um, hit on the the first question about whether or not deterrence held or not, your view of that, and then also what we need to be doing to be thinking about strategic deterrence as a separate category. Sure. And I'll, I'll come to that question here in just a moment. Uh, I am going to speak about strategic deterrence, <clears throat> by which in, in U.S. terminology uh, means the circumstances under which we both message and would consider employing nuclear weapons together with a wide range of other conventional kinetic and non-kinetic capabilities. So I think as we think about this, <clears throat> it's helpful to to simplify our understanding of the aspects of strategic deterrence into two categories. The first is cost imposition, which is consistent with uh, the general's presentation on, on fear. The other is denial, denial of the perceived benefits that the adversary uh, believes they will reap if they engage in whatever it is that we seek to cause them not to do. So if I, if I make a few brief points on cost imposition, I think we, we fairly well understand what dictatorial regimes prize most. And therefore, we need to focus our capability development and our messaging of intention in a couple of discrete areas. First is regime survival. That if you do this, we will target the regime. And we will target the apparatus that is keeping the dictator in place. We will also target military capabilities, and we will target the industrial complex that is supporting the war effort. We have to be able to, credi to credibly threaten 
both in response and if necessary in preemption uh, to defend ourselves. We also, as we I think have seen in spades with the repeat uh, threats by Putin, Medvedev and others, that we need a mix of capabilities that are both nuclear and non-nuclear that allow us to match and overmatch adversarial efforts that threaten to escalate to coerce de-escalation. This is why we have nuclear gravity bombs uh, with NATO, under NATO control. This is why we in the US have a low yield submarine launch ballistic missile. And this is why Congress is funding, uh, even over the objections of the Biden administration, development of a nuclear sea launch cruise missile. Putin and Xi Jinping need to understand <clears throat> that we today have and we will in the future have more capacity to counter like with like and then some. If I turn now briefly to the concept of denial, <clears throat> I think there are two aspects, again, that we should uh, take into account. The first thing we have to do is we have to understand the adversary's theory of victory and we have to take actions that reduce it to a questionable hypothesis as opposed to a theory. This, among other things, means that we have to assure dominance in the, all of the warfighting domains, including the informational and economic. And it also means degradation of those adversary capabilities that it believes are necessary and essential for it to win, both in the event of hostilities and, in some cases, in the run-up to hostilities. Now, this is why you see the United States investing heavily in resilience of our command and control, it's why we're investing in resiliency with regard to our space architecture, investing in our subsurface capabilities, and so on. And I think, uh, actually, as Hans alluded to, uh, resiliency when it comes to critical infrastructure is also quite important, particularly in the European context, given how we've seen Putin target Ukrainian civil in infrastructure. One of the capabilities that I believe has been greatly underemployed uh, in connection with deterrence, and, and perhaps because it has been less understood uh, in previous years, is the use of financial and economic tools in, a, in advance of hostilities to begin the graduated infliction of cost and to cause the regime to recognize that the true cost that sanctions and export controls and other measures will inflict on them should they actually do whatever it is we are seeking to deter them from doing. Now, because these measures take time to create results and because they are ineffective when they're only partially employed, uh, it's crucial that you start early and, when, and prior to hostilities in some cases. And when hostilities occur, you have to impose immediate, overwhelming, and lasting financial and e economic consequences. We have not done this in connection with Ukraine, and I believe to Rebecca's point, uh, this is a major reason why uh, deterrence failed. Putin gambled that we wouldn't inflict the kind of serious economic harm on the Russian economy, that he would be able to weather whatever was done, that he would be able to keep the war machine going. And unfortunately, so far, he's been proven right on this point, though the alliance, the European Union, the UK, and others are steadily increasing the pressure on on the Russian Federation. I also want to pick up on something that Asta said um, this morning, which is follow the money. I think that's exactly right when it comes to hybrid warfare. And we do need to invest, invest as, a, as, as nations and as allies in capabilities that allow us to do exactly that. I th we have the ability to shut off Russian access to physical banknotes. We've done that. Um, we have the ability to block bank accounts, to seize yachts, to seize aircraft, to seize property. But increasingly in this day and age, we are seeing uh, adversarial regimes shift towards the use of crypto assets and to move funding for hybrid warfare through those channels. And our ability to both track and intercept and block those capabilities is limited. Uh, and is perhaps being outstripped by, uh, by the investments that adversaries are making in this domain. The second aspect of denial is, is of course, you know, as Clausewitz wrote, uh, the object of defense is preservation. But as he said, we, we must defend only for so long. It is, as he said, quote, the natural course of war is to begin with the defensive and to end with the offensive. And the faster you shift to an offensive posture, uh, the better, uh, because as we've seen in the case of Bukha, with genocidal regimes, 
like the, like the Chinese and like the Russians, uh, every day of occupation begins to pose an existential threat to the national survival of smaller allies like Lithuania. And so that's why increased defense investment by all allies, including the 23 countries who are greatly derelict in meeting their obligations, is so important. It's also why the permanent stationing of significant combat capability along NATO's eastern front is urgently needed. One final point. Uh, one of the major challenges that we face uh, in Washington as we talk about these issues, as we work through these issues, as we look at the investments that we need to make in our capabilities, both nuclear and non-nuclear, both kinetic and non-kinetic, is the rise of China, the rapid rise of China, and the massive uh, secretive breakout of their nuclear weapons program. Uh, the Chinese today field more ICBM launcher silos than the United States has. They are clearly seeking parity, quantitative parity, and quite possibly nuclear superiority uh, in terms of deployed warheads over both the United States and Russia. Historically, we've, been, we've had the luxury of thinking through strategic deterrence in a purely bilateral Cold War Soviet, U.S., Russian, U.S. framework where other problem sets like the limited number of Chinese weapons or the North Koreans or you name it were sort of these lesser included uh, scenarios. We can't do that anymore. We have to think about strategic deterrence in a trilateral way with two and soon to be three countries that field roughly comparable numbers of weapons and in the case of Russia a vast arsenal of, of nuclear weapons deployed on shorter and medium-range systems, uh, which the United States by and large does not have. So this is a, a challenging uh, matter as we begin to think through the sizing of our capabilities, the, the stationing of our capabilities, the employment scenarios, where we may have to look at strategic deterrence in a two simultaneous uh, crises uh, manner. Uh, uh, that thinking is ongoing, and it's, I think it's moving in the right direction, but um, investment in these capabilities, as you just said, uh, regardless of what you're talking about, takes time. And in the case of the United States, the modernization of our deterrent is long overdue, uh, and we're in a situation now where the current planned modernization is, is essential, it's vital, and it will not be sufficient. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, thank you very much for, for organizers for <coughs> inviting me. It's great to be here. And I would like first to address directly your questions and answer these questions with 100% uh, of certainty. Uh, this certainty stems from the fact that I'm layman in military affairs. So if you are a layman, you have Android always 100% sure that you can answer any question. So uh, the answer to the first question is uh, obviously yes, we are successful in deter deterrence because uh, NATO countries weren't attacked still so far. Today it's 24th of uh, March 2024. We are still alive in Vilnius, nice spring weather. So uh, it was a success from the side of NATO. But definitely the answer for the second question is, of course, uh, not only NATO, but also not only the United States, but the West failed in deterred uh, um, Russia from uh, aggressive policies. Uh, uh, and I think that this is uh, pretty obvious because we are talking about the, 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 the past, yes? The war started on the 24th of February 2022, it's a fact. Uh, so this aggression, by the way, did not start uh, a year ago. It started uh, in February 2014 by taking Crimea. But of course, we have to remember about the Georgian war and the Putin's uh, speech in 2007 to the Munich uh, conference, which should be a kind of uh, alert for the West what is uh, the prediction for the future. So uh, definitely uh, the West, the so-called collective West, like we are called uh, in, in Kremlin, uh, uh, failed in doing this. We have uh, quite an interesting question why we failed. And uh, I think that the part of the answer to this question is that simply the West uh, did not uh, know the Putin's mind and his accomplices. Uh, I think that the uh, level of expertise in Russia was uh, really uh, low at all levels. So first of all, we had some kind of lack of knowledge on how Russia operates and how Russia, what, what is Russia actually, what is the culture of Russia. 
a lot of uh, things which are happening now in Ukraine are surprising Western people. For example, all these atrocities in Bakhmut and uh, in surroundings, but uh, they did it uh, exactly the same in Chechnya in 1994. Please uh, remember about it in Syria in 2012, 13 and 14th. Uh, uh, so I think that what comes as a surprise to the Western people, it's not quite surprising for the Eastern world, uh, Eastern uh, uh, Europeans, because uh, this is what we dealt with uh, for quite a long uh, of time. The second uh, uh, part of the answer to this question, why we failed, because we do not understand properly uh, Russia and uh, Putin, is coming from the fact that there was a huge investment uh, in denying some quite uh, obvious things. Uh, today, please uh, watch what is happening. Today we are saying that uh, Russia is an existential threat, that Russia is endangering the whole NATO, that Russia is endangering the uh, collective West. But all these things uh, uh, said openly two, three, four years ago in the West would be considered outrageous. Uh, I published a lot on uh, um, these Ukrainian issues after 2014 and visited a lot of uh, Western universities and institutions and it was considered to be Russophobic mm -hmm. because there was a huge investment in considering Rus uh, Russia and Putin as a respectable leader of uh, uh, important uh, um, uh, countries and important states. So this huge investment was simply uh, uh, giving this uh, account into the uh, kind of uh, uh, lacking, not only of lacking of knowledge, but also uh, denying the facts and uh, observing reality in a different way. We, just to put it shortly, did not understand the Putin's mind and, and his, his, his accomplices, and of course we were not very much interested in understanding how do they perceive the world. Because when we are talking about the world, and if we want to address all these questions uh, uh, which were um, uh, provided to us, uh, uh, these questions, what do they want to fight for and uh, what do they uh, suffer for achieving their goals, uh, we have to understand how they operate. And there was no much interest in understanding how they operate, what they consider important, and how they perceive the world. The uh, Russian perception of the world was completely uh, neglected, and hence we have this huge uh, kind of a surprise on what happened uh, 13 months uh, ago in uh, Ukraine. Uh, I think that there is, of course, a lot of uh, lessons to be learned for the future, and I guess that we will have a next round on the future, so I'm not going to, 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 to tackle this issue uh, now, but I would like to just to, to, to tell you that simply uh, we were not capable of uh, perceiving uh, uh, the threats which are coming from Russia in the uh, right uh, uh, way. And this is our collective uh, failure, of course. I'm not saying that we were better prepared to understand it, because all these kind of issues which are tackled upon here were also neglected in Poland. So I'm not going to say that we in East, East, Eastern Europeans or Central <coughs> Europeans, as we would like, would like to, to, to be called, uh, uh, were in a much better position because many, 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 many of uh, obvious facts were simply uh, conveniently uh, ignored. Uh, as we can see, all these strategies, all these tactics which are applied towards Russia are failing now. Because what we have heard about just five minutes ago, uh, uh, of course yachts and uh, properties were seized. Uh, does it make any change? And the answer is... No, because uh, Russia and Russian oligarchs are not operating in this way that when we are taking their yachts and properties, they are uh, going to increase influence, whatever it is, on uh, President Putin to change the policy. The policy of Russia is unchanged since 2014, maybe since 2007, but we simply do not want to know in which way we can effectively uh, uh, affect uh, Russian leadership and of course we are not much interested in w what kind of language we should uh, talk to them because uh, what they perceive as a kind of a threat that we are going to defend every inch of NATO's, uh, uh, NATO's uh, uh, territory is perceived in Moscow as a kind of a def very defense, very weak uh, uh, approach uh, towards the problem. So we are in defense actually and not in offense. They are in offense uh, and they can sell this aggression as a kind of uh, glory for mother Russia 
uh, uh, recapturing their former land from the Soviet Union. And of course, we should remember that uh, President Putin was saying that uh, the geopolitical, the, the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century was the dissolution of the uh, Soviet Union. By the way, there was an important issue here tackled upon during the first panel, I guess, uh, or the second panel, uh, that um, should we uh, be afraid of uh, uh, collapse uh, of uh, the Russian Federation. No, we shouldn't. Why? Because we survived the first collapse of Russian Federation under the name of Soviet Union. As you can see, Soviet Union is still alive after 1991. They managed to tackle with it and we managed to tackle with it. So please do not be afraid of this because I think that this is the way when we can just change the uh, uh, kind of uh, rules of the game and rules of engagement and in this way to put uh, uh, offensive on our side, not on the side of our uh, opponent, I dare say even enemy of the West, because we have to understand that uh, what we are just observing is not going to end soon. This is just the beginning of the transformation of the global order. And of course, as we remember, the Korean War in 1950 was the first proxy war between Soviet Union and the United States, with the use of the United States Army, by the way. And what we are observing today in Ukraine is the first proxy war between China and the United States, but it's not going to be the last. So just putting this to the end and maybe we can just go to the future. Great. I'm actually going to pull a little bit from each of the statements to ask the next question, which is, I think, I think it's really important to point out, especially in the last two remarks, um, that, we, that we have to understand the China-Russia challenge together and that we cannot overly compartmentalize those two threat sets. I will say from the U.S. Uh, perspective that um, although China remains as a matter of U.S. policy the pacing threat, it's the country that has the greatest capability and will to do the most harm to the United States to supplant us, that Russia is still a top tier strategic threat to the United States of America. It is the junior partner to China that does not mean um, that, that the threat that Russia can still pose has been significantly diminished to the point where we can't be um, appropriately uh, concerned about that. So that, that's the first kind of uh, point that I kind of wanted to pull out and make sure that was very clear so that the, the panelists can, can talk about that. And then the other point was about this concept of fear um, that, that we addressed in, in the initial presentation. And, and then is it not true, um, and this is my view, that, uh, that the alliance in the United States has been overly risk averse and perhaps afraid, and I think it's, it would serve us well to, to kind of grapple with it and understand it, this fear of escalation, this risk aversion, and it's a fear of escalation because with that fear of escalation, we spend so much time talking to one another and reassuring one another that we're not doing anything that could be perceived as escalatory rather than convincing the Russians that they should be afraid that, that Ukraine could escalate it to their advantage. For instance, uh, we talk a lot about categories of weapons that have been prohibited from being deployed to Ukraine, but then eventually were deployed to, to Ukraine and sent, but in slower numbers. Um, intelligence sharing, that kind of thing. Um, but then I would also put on the table that we still, um, as an alliance, are prohibiting Ukraine from striking Russian targets that are targeting their cities that are on the other side of the Ukrainian border. That we're keeping the war intentionally um, perhaps the defensive, yes, it's defensive, um, but it's going to be long and protracted. If Ukraine is not permitted to defend itself the way NATO would defend <coughs> itself, it should NATO be attacked. And so if you could talk about this, this, this concept of fear and our inability to enable Ukraine to compel the Russians to stop and to end the war on terms favorable to Ukraine, um, and whether or not um, we are still operating from a place of fear rather than from a place of courage and strength to do what is necessary. Uh, from a Swedish point of view, you could say it's a cultural thing. Uh, we have our tradition of being a consensus-prone country. Uh, we do not like conflict. Uh, that's why we try to stay away from it. Um, so I, I think that we have it in, in our genes. Uh, when I started uh, my, my tour at the Baltic Defense College, one of the Latvian uh, colleagues said, Michael, are you like all the rest of the Swedish population? And I said, what do you mean by that? Well, you, you, can, never, um, have a, you can never make a statement. 
of your own. You, you, you always say, well, on the one this side or on the other side, and you can always think in this way and you can always think that way. I said, now uh, perhaps I'm, I'm not very typical Swedish land, um, but we have a tradition of consensus and all, all, um, the, the whole nation basically is, is around consensus. And we, you can see that in the parliamentary debates uh, how we deal with the business community, etc., etc., etc. So it's it's a cultural thing, um, and I think we need to more think inwards to understand our fears and our uh, vital interests before we are approaching outside, because we we need to to grasp our own problems inside. What are we? Uh, what are our vital interests? What are we willing to risk? What are we afraid of as a nation? And when we grasp that, perhaps we can more be more forceful uh, and have a standpoint and stand for something that is more aggressive and offensive than we are today. Thank you, Michael. Your slip. Thank you for these questions. Uh, this concept of fear, um, we have, as, as Poles, a relatively low level of, uh, of fear, and sometimes uh, we had some uprisings and, and different commitments uh, that, were, uh, come, that came from our romantic side, so uh, this is not a problem. But fear, of course, this is something what Putin wants us to feel, and to have every 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 morning, and he is quite successful with that. Uh, that's why, in terms of our future strategic uh, communication, strategic deterrence is key, key from from my perspective. Uh, this uh, um, addressing the fear, uh, how to uh, keep it, of course, uh, relatively. Um, wise and, and of course uh, uh, true. Uh, that is that is the major uh, obstacle, major challenge for our democracies, uh, especially with facing some elections uh, uh, in our countries. Uh, uh, we have those every five, four years elections. That's that's a real challenge in the, in terms of that. Because in some countries, some governments even want to have this fear at a certain level uh, to, um, to address the public that they are the only ones that can defend uh, this society and the country. But in terms of uh, NATO, uh, we need some adjustments. Always, I, I was a great advocate for that, that NATO needs uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, tools for strategic pub outcome, uh, for strategic publications, strategic uh, um, communication, it's, it's well progressed, but still could be um, perhaps a bit more done. Uh, as for Russia-China, uh, as it was shown one year ago, surprises are still on the table. Um, maybe if I could try to be a bit more optimistic, it's, it's not so obvious that Russia will be a junior partner of China uh, one day. Maybe that's, that's the, that, should be, that should be still somehow our goal. Uh, sanctions, as it was uh, already mentioned, are quite difficult, but uh, I believe they are working. Uh, and in terms of the long-term perspective, uh, could be in favor of uh, our thinking and our, our strategic uh, points. So... Uh, uh, that's that's uh, and and one point about uh, prohibiting Ukraine of of shelling some Ukrainian cities. Uh, yes, uh, that's that's that shouldn't happen, I believe. But uh, it's not NATO. I believe it's major countries that are providing those ammunitions uh, are still thinking uh, or debating about those issues. And it was mentioned, I believe, by uh, General Hodges that if they have attack camps and they could use it, uh, it would be a real different situation for the, for the Ukrainians. Thank you. Thank you. Marshall. <clears throat> when you talk about fear of escalation, what you're really talking about is deterrence at work. And it's <clears throat> really vital in connection with Ukraine, but I think more broadly, that, uh, that we have to make very clear our willingness to escalate 
Uh, if the adversary, in the case of the Russians or the Chinese, perceive that we're not willing to escalate, <clears throat> in fact, when we de-escalate uh, in response to whatever we think was an escalatory action on the part of, of them, and anybody who's dealt with the Russians in any form of, of official capacity will, will recognize this. By de-escalating and pulling back, <clears throat> the Russians step forward, and they step into the gap, and they close the gap again, and it incentivizes them to take increasingly risky, reckless actions. And so the far better course of the more prudent course in these situations <clears throat> is that when Russia engages in a provocative action, you have to respond with consequence, cost imposition. So rather than doing what we just did by deci deciding after they attacked our drone over the international water and in now deciding that we're going to fly the drones even further back, there should have been other consequences. We should have, for instance, immediately released F-16s to Ukraine to demonstrate to Putin that his actions have consequences. If you don't do that, he will incrementally continue to move and move and move until, until there's nowhere to move but into NATO territory. To put a finer point on that concept too, Marshall, that you just said so eloquently, um, risk aversion has not actually averted uh, uh, escalation. And our risk aversion has actually increased escalation, but the one controlling the escalation is are the Russians. All right, Richard? Well, <clears throat> escalation will emerge when the West is going to step down and step back. So this is the risk of escalation. When we are not doing, doing this, they are not going to escalate this kind of uh, conflict into another level. I, I, of course, not 100% sure, but this is what I'm thinking. But uh, I think that to, well, Putin is playing a very interesting psychological war against the West, not only the minds of uh, the decision makers, but also against the societies, Western societies. But he's using quite simple uh, means. Uh, for example, the tweets by the former Russian president Medvedev, uh, who is now just a Russian troll. But he used to be a president of this uh, power, if not superpower, and he was considered by the liberal uh, West as a kind of a liberal who is going to bring liberalism into uh, Russia. Remember what about Medvedev was uh, uh, written in 2007 and 2008 when he captured his uh, office and actually under Medvedev there was a Georgian war, not under Putin. Putin was just a prime minister there. So I think that this kind of uh, alert should be ringing earlier. But I think that uh, yes, definitely the answer from my side is yes, uh, well, the West is risk averse and uh, is uh, fearing for kind of an escalation. And as soon as, uh, uh, well, as long as we are just acting in this way, uh, there will be still psychological advancement from the Russian side. When we stop and when we uh, change our, our, our attitude towards this conflict, uh, there will be change on the other side as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Now, I'm, I'm going to, uh, for this next round, I'm going to let all, all of you, um, if there's something that you wish that you would have said about what we should be doing um, very specifically to increase deterrence of, of NATO's Eastern Front or anything else that you want to talk about, that, that's fine in this context. Um, I just think it's, a, I think it's important to spend all the time we just did thinking about deterrence and whether or not deterrence failed so that we can learn from that in order to move forward. And also so that we can actually get to the end of this war, which it's only going to change, in my view, if we change the strategy to empower Ukraine to victory. Um, so you can comment on, on that point, but I do have a question here from online that is something that I was thinking about, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it, and it's about um, the defense industrial base of, of all of our countries. There is a view in the United States that pops up now and again that because China is our number one threat, that the United States is depleting um, uh, some of our weapons as we send them to Ukraine, and, and that would be, uh, it's a cost that's too high for the United States because we need to be focusing on getting capacity into the, uh, the Pacific theater. My response to that, and then I'll turn it over to you all and you can speak about your own respective countries and how you view it, is that since the Cold War, the United States has allowed our defense industrial base across the board to shrink. 
and that out of this tragedy of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Ukraine's courageous and um, incredibly inspiring uh, success in, in, in pushing and in, in fighting back um, the Russians, that has provided an opportunity for all of us to actually reinvest in our defense industrial bases so that we can produce the necessary weapons at the scale we need and at the speed that we need. Um, and, and so from the U.S. perspective, we've seen that in real time. In the case of harpoons, we're making many more harpoons to send to Ukraine, and now the Australians are buying them for their needs. And so it's not, it's not just zero sum in that respect, that it's actually creating, um, it's, it's jump-starting the defense industrial base in a way to get supply chains going and thinking about those again, getting cold lines warm, warm lines hot, to be able to get to the point where we can produce those weapons at the necessary scale for both, for both theaters. And with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Michael to see if he has some remarks from his perspective. Just to give you some numbers, in Sweden we have 1.3 million companies of different size. Uh, and uh, beginning 2015, basically, we started to work with more than 200 of them who are essential to the performance of the armed forces, uh, to work with them and to see what kind of uh, changes we need to make in order for them to provide uh, their support even if in wartime. Because before 2015 you, you could say you had peacetime, peacetime agreements uh, with most of the companies. Uh, they were working Labor Days, Monday, Friday, and uh, they got extra pay if they worked Saturday, Sunday. Uh, now we are changing that, uh, writing new agreements uh, and new deals w with them, uh, and that's, that's necessary because they need to be operate, operational even if uh, we are at war. Um, we are lucky um, because we have a very diversified and um, broad uh, industrial base, and we work closely with them. And, and the Swedish tradition is to have a sort of a helix between the government, uh, the academia, and uh, the industry, and it works uh, quite well. Uh, we have them close to us when we are working here and now, and we also have them with us when we are looking about looking for what what kind of defense should we have 2045, 2050. Uh, so we have a good integration uh, with the industry, I would say. So I, I'm quite convinced that they will support and they will be ready to support if needed. Um. Yes, if I may. Uh, I believe I addressed this in my initial remarks. That's what we, uh, in, in my opinion, failed to, to have the progress on those industrial, uh, defense industrial base. Um, specifically, uh, uh, if we don't provide some adjustments to the current, uh, uh, current factories. Uh, so old times, I mean, like we have this, this, this war in Ukraine, which is purely conventional, so we have to come back to this uh, purely conventional approach to some factories where could be switched to, to defense production overnight. Of course, it doesn't happen, doesn't happen overnight, but uh, with additional, additional magazines, additional factories in the back of the real factory. There were even jokes like about production, different categories of, of, of things back in, during the Soviet times when uh, it was assembled from the parts. It wasn't washing machine, it was, it was the tank uh, outside the factory. But, but that's something what we need uh, all over Europe. Uh, the, I, I know US is quite pretty big and, and quite ready, but perhaps not, for, not all of that. But that's something what we need. And if, if I would like add some word, as you, as you mentioned, Rebecca, or asked from the previous remarks, I, I, I will use uh, the word uh, used a couple times by uh, Colonel Kiesewetter, stop being naive. That's, that's something I would, I would like to add about Russia, of course, and sometimes about ourselves, but uh, <coughs> be, uh, be, um, be ready for any... Uh, outcome and for any um, contingency. Great, and I, and I will say it's the high, high, it's high Mars, what I meant to say, not the harpoons, the Australians have just announced that they're purchasing, but Marshall? Yeah, so sustainment uh, of the war effort uh, is, is a vital concept, as was discussed on one of the earlier panels. 
uh, in the United States, um, a, a large percentage of the amounts of money that you see being uh, proclaimed by the Biden administration are, in fact, uh, funds that are going into revitalization of our manufacturing base. And, uh, and that's essential. And one of the silver linings to an otherwise pretty uh, atrocious situation is that we've woken up to realize that the manufacturing base is going to be insufficient to sustain the fight against the Chinese. So the investments are being made now and hopefully will result in uh, manufacturing capacity uh, that will be available uh, in time. Uh, this idea of just-in-time procurement is, is not a workable construct in a major conventional war uh, situation. Now, two other points. <clears throat> one is, one, one of the main drains on the United States is the fact that Ukraine has to spend far more uh, munitions, particularly howitzer rounds, 155 rounds, than it should have to because we are blindering them with the provision of the, the necessary tactical intelligence support uh, to do better effective fires. So it's actually within our own capacity and the capacity of the alliance to allow the Ukrainians to make far better use uh, of the weapons that we've given them and to provide them weapons that actually push back uh, the Russians uh, and are able to strike the Russians uh, where they, they need to be struck. Final point. Uh, it is a bit of a... Um, as we would say, in, in, I'll let the interpreters figure this one out, it, it's a stalking horse in some respects to claim that the munitions being furnished to Ukraine are being done so at the expense of Taiwan. And that's false for a, a number of reasons, or I should say not entirely true for a number of reasons, because many of the weapons and the nature of the fight over Taiwan will be fundamentally different. Uh, it will be a maritime fight, uh, it will be a suppression of A2 AD fight. Uh, it will be, yes, there will be a land aspect, uh, but when we start talking about what, what uh, the Taiwanese need, it's not complete overlap with what the Ukrainians have been asking for. So we can't allow ourselves to, to decide that in an either-or scenario, we have to prioritize a, a Taiwan contingency at the expense of the horrific atrocities that are being conducted by the Ukrainians today. Thank you. Richard? Well, I will answer this question in this way. This is obvious that we should increase the capacity and capabilities of our military industry and uh, military force uh, as a general because it's just needed. Uh, we are living in such an uh, era when the wars are going to be well, quite frequent, I guess. so. I strongly encourage Polish government to, to, to increase spendings on this, and as you know, government is listening, but not to me, but to other experts, of course. Uh, I'm strongly encouraging the German government to, sp to start spending 100 billion euros on uh, investing in Bundeswehr and uh, uh, military uh, industry of Germany, because maybe one day you are going to help us when we are defending our territory. Of course, I'm strongly encouraging the American uh, government to do the same, because you are going to fight a lot of wars in future. So. You need it. But uh, just to put it in this way, I don't want to be perceived as a person who come here from unknown place and uh, just start uh, Western bashing. Uh, I do not think that uh, all this thing can deter Hitler's like-minded uh, person like Putin. So this is the point which I would like to make clearly. I do not think that any of these kind of activities would deter effectively Putin from doing what he's doing now. So this is the, the, the main point, I think. But we need it, definitely. It, it, it's a good point. And then I would also add, too, one of the things I want to be clear about as, you know, as I um, offer some uh, criticisms of what has happened so that we can uh, learn to compel now better um, and coerce the, it's really compellence um, in, in right now as the war on, is ongoing, but then also bolstering future deterrence um, in, from the United States' perspective, uh, the Eastern Front is in particular a major area of concern for us, um, also the Asia-Pacific context, but all of this, especially the points that Marshall made, all of this is, um, is to increase the credibility of our deterrence. We don't want to fight these wars. We want to deter the wars. And that we understand, though, for deterrence to be, for that to be credible in the minds of our adversaries, they have to know that we are prepared to prevail if deterrence does fail. That the United States would have many options with our allies to, uh, to try to keep the violence on the lowest levels, to end the war on terms favorable to the West. Um, 
What I'd like to do now uh, is, is turn it over. We've got some time for questions from you all, and this is the best part, so I hope that you have plenty of questions from what we've said. Hans. Uh, great panel. Hans Benedijk. Um, I'd like to ask a sort of a theoretical question about deterrence and use Michael's chart uh, to do that. Uh, he had that one chart where on the uh, horizontal axis it was interest, up to vital interest, and on the vertical chart it was risk. And then he had two kinds of actors. So I think rational actor was the word he used, and then an emotional actor. And the implication was that if you were dealing with a rational actor, um, that actor will be less inclined to see an issue as incredibly, uh, as a vital uh, interest, and therefore um, will take less risk and be easier to deter. But if you're dealing with an emotional actor, uh, everything will be seen, or much more will be seen, as a vital interest. And that emotional actor would be much more willing to take higher risk. Did I read your chart correctly? Was that right? Okay. Absolutely. So if, if that is, so, first of all, I'd like to ask the rest of the panel if they see that as right. If it is, what it tells you is that deterrence is not static. I mean, mm -hmm. um, that deterrence is in the eyes of the beholder, the actor you're trying to affect. And if that individual is a rational actor, you have a better chance of deterring. Uh, if that actor is an emotional actor, uh, it's going to be harder and more dangerous. And so let me ask the panel, do they agree with Michael's assessment? And if so, is Putin an emotional actor or a rational actor? I'm happy to go. I'm happy to take a shot of that, unless somebody else is chomping at the bit to go ahead and do it, Marshall. Um, so, look, I, I don't completely agree with that uh, framework um, for a number of reasons. One, I've never been a fan of trying to ascribe rationality uh, because we we run the risk of of mirror imaging uh, what we think is rational, which which may in Putin's context be thoroughly rational from how he sees the world. Moreover, uh, some of the most effective deterrers are those who are quite rational and portray themselves as emotional and unpredictable. And uh, that is certainly something that we're seeing with, with the way uh, the Russians are trying to message. It's something that President Trump used to great effect, for instance, with regard to North Korea. So, um, it can often be quite advantageous for the adversary to perceive that they can't predict what you might do. Um, so I think those are caveat. In general, the fear question, yes, fear. I mean, fear is at, at, at the fundamental heart of deterrence, but fear of what? And that's where you have to understand what motivates these leaders. For Putin, it's fear of his own survival. At the end of the day, that's at the heart of what is motivating Vladimir Putin. Uh, I think also in the case of Xi Jinping, survival of the Chinese Communist Party. And so these are the uh, considerations we have to, to take into account as we message what we are quite prepared to do uh, in terms of both that cost imposition and the denial of benefit. Sure. Um, if I could disagree, uh, Putin is not a, a, an actor. He is a KGB operative, and he's not driven, I believe, by uh, his survival. He's driven by his legacy. And uh, whatever happened within five, ten years, uh, that's, that's about himself. That's what I, I believe. Of course, we should, we should look at, at, at specific actors, Xi Jinping, uh, but that's, that's another option. But it, the things change. So, Learning by our mistakes, you also mentioned A2, AD, that we were so much afraid about in, in terms of China or Taiwan, but we were so much afraid about Russia, Russia capabilities. We were discussing A2, AD in details, uh, exercises, Zapad, different Vostok, Center, whatever. When it turned out to, to, to when we had a real wartime, it turned out to be... Uh, untrue, I would say, uh, in, in this way. Uh, so um, that's, that's quite difficult. Uh, 
I, I only can read that things change and deterrence, sometimes deterrence we address to our own people, not to, to our adversary. That's, that's our mistake. Uh, that's I would like to uh, finish. Thank you. Let me just do a quick rejoinder. Um, any, any leader of a great power who decides that he has to sit at the end of a table 15 feet away from everybody else, who only can be photographed with, uh, with a trusted set of four or five KG, you know, FSB people when he goes out and you know, she's a stewardess on an airplane one day and she's the mother of a fallen the next day and it's the same woman and all these. That's somebody who is quite worried about his own survival. I, I, the point, point I would just make before I, before I call in the audience here too is that I think the, the larger point is that in order to do the hard, hard work of deterrence, it requires a huge amount of humility because we don't, it's not a very clear, neat mathematical formula that can be applied across, um, across all states. And so I think it's a, useful, it's a useful tool, the chart, but that we should have a, a huge amount of humility as we seek to, one, understand our adversaries, but then also it does, there is some part of it though that is you, uh, formulaic and that you have to see what are those categories that the, that the adversary values most beyond sort of the the highest levels of violence, which would be, or you know, threat of regime change, or the extinguishing of the regime. What are the other things? And then, do we have the capability to credibly put weapons on those targets in such a way that our adversary would believe that we have the will and ability to do that? So that we have a variety of options for a variety of contingencies that we can't possibly predict predict far into the future. Um, if you would like to add on to that before uh, I call into just the a comment. Um, uh, with reason, the, the, the red star reason is more to depict the economic man. You have facts and figures and that's what you calculate with. Uh, in the other aspect, when you talk about emotion, you put also a psychological aspect uh, to the equation. So I fully agree, uh, you can be fully rational and still be emotional. Hmm. Because, but it's, you have also the uh, psychological aspect uh, to take uh, into consideration. So, just if I if I might follow, would you therefore believe that Putin may be rational at some points, but he also extends to that emotional actor, um, and therefore Putin is harder to deter? Before we answer that question, let's take the next question and then we compare them and answer it as we have time. Uh, okay, I, I, I would like to address this question to Michael. Uh, uh, because uh, Sweden and, uh, of course, Finland uh, is joining NATO, yes? Uh, so, and uh, Sweden has been a very active partner of NATO already since a long time ago. So, what will be different after you join NATO and how you envision Swedish contribution to the regional uh, security of, of the Baltic Sea countries. So I'm going to, so we'll, we'll, I'll give you that question to take and you can answer the second one if you would like or we can just turn it down and we, we can take the, is the Putin, or is this to, this is really to, to Michael on the Putin question. So go ahead, okay. you can take double hitter. Yes, it, it will be difficult to understand because we, we need to understand that he's operating in two dimensions at the same time. Um, but we cannot uh, just think that he's thinking like we are doing. That, that's my main point. And I think we are more uh, bureaucrats uh, working in the space of the economic man and have a hard time understand that other people have other sort of um, uh, interests uh, that are not just facts and figures, but there's something else. And to understand what that something else is, we have a little bit hard to understand. Uh, so that, therefore, I think we often become a little bit surprised. Because how, can they really think and do like that? Hmm. Uh, for the second question, I think, uh, if, if, I, if I read the papers that we are providing now for, for advice to the Chief of Defense, uh, all, all strategy papers that we are 
uh, writing not right now is, is saying that we will take a more active, uh, forward-leaning role in, in the defense uh, of our common, uh, common area, the wider Baltic, uh, wider Baltic uh, area. Uh, and uh, in, in the conf security conference in Salem, we said three things basically. One was that we are more ready to deploy forces uh, to, uh, to the Baltic states. Uh, secondly, we can also have the integrated air, air defense. Uh, and thirdly, we will be part of the NATO uh, air, air defense, uh, missile defense. Uh, and yesterday, uh, the four chief of Air Force signed an agreement to have a sort of uh, Nordic cooperation uh, to defend the Nordic part uh, when it comes to air, surveil air surveillance uh, and also air defense. Uh, so we will have, with all the four air forces combined fighter aircraft, we will have approximately 260 aircrafts available for the defense of the Nordic countries. Uh, so there is a lot of things happen. And I think Sweden will take a greater role uh, in, in the defense of the wider Baltic states. I'm going to take one more question, and then I'm going to let everybody give their, they can answer it or answer the previous one, give their closing remarks. I, we could go another hour. I don't think I'm allowed to do that, though. Okay. Yeah. Th th thank you for very interesting topics uh, uh, for the panel. Uh, I am, I'm Gintaras Bogdanas, uh, associate expert uh, at Eastern uh, Europe Studies Center, think tank of Lithuania. Uh, so, um, well, probably all of us agree that Russia quite successful weaponized information using propaganda, deceiving uh, sometimes successfully minds and souls of our societies. Um, understanding the, the, the issue, the, the threat, as uh, one of the methods how uh, Russia acts against us, uh, collective West, if you want. Uh, I think there is not enough uh, action on, from our side. Uh, institutionally, probably we have to, to work much, much uh, harder uh, addressing the threat, uh, establishing kind of, I don't know, well, Stratcom, uh, using, exploring education means, uh, educating societies, and etc. So I would like to, 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 to hear your panels. I, I, I don't uh, uh, question for all of you how you see where is the room to, to improve our capabilities fighting this information or warfare from Russia side. And is it really serious uh, issue or, well, in parallel with uh, military threat or not? Those in charge are telling me only one person can answer this briefly. Is there somebody who really is eager to? Otherwise, we can carry on these wonderful conversations outside um, or get prepared for the Great. Um, I believe the room for that is much bigger than, than this room, uh, nice room, uh, for this improvement. Uh, not only with the Stratcom. Uh, in some countries, uh, <coughs> Lithuania is a very good example. Uh, there is the, the, the publication of uh, national intelligence estimates, some information for the people, uh, which is lacking in, in many nations. Uh, this, was, this was addressed during the first two panels. Uh, the sustainment of this uh, public opinion approach uh, towards Russia, that, that's key. Uh, and that, could be, uh, that will be a, a major obstacle, I believe, for, uh, for us to, uh, to, to, to deter Russia uh, in the future, so uh, Stratcom, uh, uh, that's something uh, really which is which is key, and that, that but that's a real problem in when you have 30, 32 nations at NATO. Uh, that's that's purely sometimes national ideas, but I know I'm going to violate I'm going to violate your instructions. Um, I think the Ukrainians have demonstrated an incredible capacity for information operations. Um, the way they are messaging, the way they are providing information, which also has to be taken with a grain of salt, um, has been highly effective. And we need to learn from how they're doing that. Second point is that one of the areas where I think the, the Biden administration has, has really excelled and something that we as an alliance need to look hard at was the preemptive declassification of information indicating and exposing Russian intentions. And we need to do more of that. 
Um, so <clears throat> exploring how do we take information that's closely held and yet put it into the public domain to preemptively kill off a forthcoming narrative is something that, that we, we need to wor work at, train on, develop doctrine for. And we should do that in the China context as well. Um, this was a uh, sobering, a very, uh, very enriching panel discussion. Um, I do want to encourage the entire audience that though the threats are, are serious and grave and challenging, that it can be done, that we should be encouraged um, that Ukraine has given us this moment, a wake-up call to really do the things that we need um, to have successful deterrence. And from the United States' perspective, the security, prosperity, and freedom of Europe is directly tied to ours. So thank you again for your time here and for the invitation. Okay, thank you for a wonderful discussion. And uh, now I think the, the best who can wrap up this conference, of course, is Ukrainian uh, expert. Uh, so I am inviting Ms. Vera Konstantinova, a former foreign policy advisor of the ch uh, to the chairman of Ukrainian parliament. So Vera, please, uh, floor is yours. Hope you have an inspiration for three uh, minutes additional arguments and reflections. First of all, thank you so much for invitation and it was a real great pleasure to back to Lithuania and to Lithuanian Parliament uh, since 2020, since the pandemic year. Um, for me, um, I'm from Mariupol city and of course that's a personal story and the personal reflections. Um, following yesterday's of records discussions and um, today's statements, it's a great privilege as well as a great uh, responsibility to underline some key takeaways from our discussions. Um, first of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all contributions and uh, to all partners, uh, expert communities, expertise that we since 20. 14 Ukraine received from our colleagues and uh, for me it's obvious that um, that's our common victory would be a common victory over Russian neo-imperialism Russian imperial pains and of course coming closer to the final reflections I would say that for me the main idea of this conference when it comes to the effective defense or deterrence, um, the core stone is people, highly motivated, highly qualified. Um, the successful defense, or as well as deterrence, uh, start with society's readiness to protect itself by all available means. Weapons, diplomatic, political, informational tools or instruments, um, they are just instruments that should be on table on the run within the right hands. And of course, uh, well-trained hands of both civilians and uh, women and men who are now in military service. Um, I am maybe, I'm so realistic and pragmatic right now. Of course, Russia plans to continue its aggression up to the end. Uh, and for me, it's obvious that Russia is not going to stop its aggression. Uh, but, uh, you know, the new Cold War reality is outdoors and uh, we have to uh, understand this as soon as possible. Um, but from other side, I would say that we, I believe that we have a window of opportunities. Uh, and I believe that this window would, would be opened for Ukraine on uh, Vilnius summit uh, and new perspective for Ukraine uh, would come due to several reasons. First of all, with what I would definitely agree that we need to be frank in our assessment of our adversaries. From our perspective, I mean from Ukrainian expert community, uh, we had failed on our assessment, not only on Russia, but on Iran also, unfortunately. But I hope that the, lesson, the lessons had been learned not only from our experience. Uh, the second point, while Russia is uh, declining power, I would say that Ukraine would become a driver of economic 
growth in Europe when we start the process of reconstruction. Uh, but we need to be as much realistic as possible. This war should be finished on Ukraine's terms. Um, and the third point, I would say that definitely assurances are failed to be a good tool for deterrence. Sanctions are not enough to uh, be a good in effect and effective for effective de deterrence. Uh, from my side, I would say the com comprehensive approach is needed and with all instruments available uh, on the table. Uh, indeed, Ukraine's war had changed the way they were conducting, but uh, we have talked about the instruments of maintaining unity uh, within the Europe. We have talked about the, um, what constitu constitutes Ukraine's victory. I cannot agree more uh, that hybrid war conducted against Europe uh, while we are sitting here at the Lithuanian Parliament. Russia is a strategic adversary and no more reliable partner or even a partner for Europe. Instead, Ukrainian, Ukrainians and um, Ukraine we have on the table. Uh, but for us um, and from our perspective, Ukraine is the most important partner right now for Europe because uh, we can ensure the long-term long security and long-term prosperity. Uh, because without security, we wouldn't have any uh, prospects, prospects for sustainable development or economic growth. And this war has shown to us Ukrainians that we can rely on our defense capabilities as well as on each other. But at the same time, we can rely on our partners, our true friends and true partners. From my side, uh, I would say that Russia had already failed. Despite the war is ongoing, but uh, strategically Russia has failed uh, because Ukrainians, our political and military leadership, our armed forces are committed to defend Ukraine as long as it takes. And we deter Russia um, for more than a year in, our, in this hot phase of this war, but uh, we deter Russia since 2014. Standing with Ukraine means to stand not only for freedom, but it means to stand for international rule-based order, for principles of peaceful coexistence that identified uh, in the UN uh, chapter. And for me, um, this war has been, had demonstrated that each nation should be ready to protect itself, to rely on own defense capabilities, but international cooperation is vital for all our nations. Ukrainian people didn't choose such a destiny um, to be on the front line uh, of the battlefield. But nowadays I see our mission became much more broader and the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian society appear to be the only force in Europe that proved to be successful in deterrence of so-called second army. From Ukrainian perspective, we had changed the way the history going, not only for um, Europe, but I guess, first of all, for us. And we would continue to, to stand for our freedom as long as it takes. And we need enough weapons and enough political support uh, to finish this war. Um, I believe that after the end of hot phase, Ukraine would be the cost torn for European security architecture. Uh, last but not least, um, about fears. Fears of escalations or fears of um, Russia's possible dissolution. Um, from my point of view, escalation would come despite any actions that we would made in the West or in Ukraine if Russian leadership would fail a moment appropriate moment. Um, from other side, um, I would say that we need to have, um, to be prepared for different scenarios, even the scenario of Russia's dissolution. Not to make, uh, not to make this mistake again, and my message maybe to all our partners, stay brave together with Ukraine, trust Ukraine, Ukraine's armed forces as we do, and uh, help us to fulfill our new mission 
to, defense, to defend both freedom and international rule-based order. Uh, while Ukrainians uh, sacrifice their lives on the battlefield, realistic scenarios on how to deal with possible Russia dissolution should be developed. Uh, to be honest, we have lack of time for discussions. Uh, we need a concept vision for such a scenario. And uh, from a practical uh, aspect, I would say that to be prepared man means to be successful in uh, deterrence and uh, uh, Ukraine um, I'm sure that Ukraine will definitely win this war. Um, our armed forces have already learned how to ensure the um, security of borders. In other words, Ukraine, Ukraine can defend its borders uh, as NATO borders. Yes, Ukraine needs NATO to secure our territorial integrity and sovereignty uh, within the uh, internationally recognized borders of 1991. But at the same time, NATO needs Ukraine in for a new European architecture, security architecture. Our armed forces is already par a part, I guess, of NATO deterrence efforts um, on the eastern flank. flank. And for me, um, Ukraine's membership in, in alliance is the key moment of truth and uh, recognition that um, NATO membership of Ukraine is the best long-term solution and best long-term guarantees for territorial integrity and sovereignty as well as it could be a guarantee for Europe and the global prosperous future. Thank you for your attention, for your kind words uh, dedicated to Ukraine, Ukrainian armed forces, Ukrainian people, um, to our resilience, these two days was very, were very inspirational and hope to continue our cooperation in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, just one more small uh, observation from my side uh, before I announce the, the over uh, finish of uh, finalizing of the conference. I think deterrence by unified defense, we can look at it as, a, as to the process, yes? The evolution, uh, probably. And I think uh, the war shows us that maybe some processes in this evolution should be revolution, re revolutionized. So maybe we must try to make some things faster. So that's my final thought. and. Uh, Thank you for all of you, for moderators and speakers, for your contribution. It was an outstanding contribution. And also, I would like to thank uh, Emile. She, she, she is the one who has <laughs> helped to, to do th things moving. Uh, and also, I would like to thank you very much for our main partner, the Lithuanian Parliament. So we, we we hope to continue the same uh, tradition with the conferences. And also to the main supporters of this event, which uh, without your support, it never happened. So, uh, Konrad Adenauer's uh, Stiftung Foundation, uh, Baltic American Freedom Foundation, NATO Public uh, Diplomacy Division, and uh, International Republicans Institute, and other very important and uh, essential partners. So, thank you for all of your, your contribution. <laughs>